Good morning to you all. I'm very happy to welcome you at um, the Institut National d'Histoire de l'Art. Bonjour à tous et à toutes um, for this conference on uh, xerography as practiced by women artists from the 1960s to the 1990s. Um, let me begin with an anecdote uh, that some of you know, but, but nevertheless is always worth telling in this kind of context. Um, when I organized an exhibition on, on the visual culture of European punk at Villa Medici, I, I had the visit of a um, British uh, curator from the Tate, and she was a very well-known uh, art critic specializing in, in conceptual art and, and all that, and she was looking at the exhibition and, and noticing that there were only, I mean, mainly photocopies in, in the exhibition. She suddenly turned to me and said, but why don't you show originals? <laughs> um, and it was difficult for me to explain to her that, that, I mean, those were the original artworks, or maybe they weren't artworks, or maybe they weren't original, but that was the point of this kind of production. I know that you're sort of um, not tackling those issues directly of um, this kind of, of uh, Geography, um, and and I, I'm thinking of a couple of, of women uh, punk artists that would have been relevant in this context, and, and French ones like um, Olivia Clavel. Um, as I noticed that there's no French artist in in the um, in in the conference, but that's fine with me. I, I don't care that much about that. Um, I'm just noticing it. Um, Going away from that personal note, uh, I'm, I must say that I'm very happy that uh, this whole project was uh, worked out in partnership with the Getty Research Institute, um, and I'm very happy to welcome here uh, Andrew Perchuk. Um, we'll have, or you'll have a, a Zoom conversation, I think, with uh, Zana Gilbert um, a little bit later. Um, it is the kind of project that Yena Shai is really caring about, and we have, um, over the years of, of, of the 20 years of, of Yena Shai, we've been working with the GRI or on, on many projects and, and still plan to, to do so on, on many others. This is a, a special um, project also because it is going along with the idea of, of what's the reason for Yena Shah. Um, it is a subject that, that is um, concerned with um, um, a subject, uh, a topic that hasn't been really researched. And um, it is very important for us to foster research on newer fields and, and newer approaches. In a way, uh, we were never very officially, um, um, how, how would I say, committed to um, um, women uh, artists or women art history. Uh, but nevertheless, in fact, when you're looking at what happened at Yen uh, you realize that this has been ingrained in, in many of the, the research programs and, and events that, that we've organized. But it's also, for me, another reason to rejoice um, that this uh, conference, as some others, is um, specifically uh, addressing this, this question of the um, uh, presence of women artists in a specific field or medium. I don't know whether we can still use the word medium, medium uh, when speaking about geography, but I suppose that that's uh, something you're going to speak about. Um, if we can, I think it's also um, very fitting that, that this happens at Yenasha because we are focusing on, on this idea of, of uh, trans uh, media um, and, and the question of, of uh, the various disciplines and, and techniques is actually one of the main fields of research um, here. Um, and last but not least, I'm, I'm happy about this um, conference because uh, it is a way to make um, art historians from the academy, art critics, uh, art curators, um, um, artists, to speak together, and that's also at the core of, of what Yenasha is about uh, in a country and in a context 
where these worlds are specifically uh, kept apart by some kind of uh, um, legal separations, which is a bit different from many other countries. I, I know that, it, that the situation is not, uh, maybe uh, is, is, there's a kind of division, but, but not that strong, uh, as strong as, as what happens in, in France. Um, the whole project was um, devised by, uh, through a partnership between the uh, Laboratoire HAR from uh, Université Paris-Nanterre, uh, the Getty Research Institute, the um, Centre Georges Pompidou, the film department at the Centre Pompidou, and the AWARE Association, and, and they're all good friends, I must say, so, so I'm, I'm, I'm also happy about that. Um, it's, it's not always the case, and, and in this case, I, I mean personal friends. Um, and, and through this organization, um, we are very lucky today that we have a lot of um, participants from all over the world, or at least the Western world. Um, and, and that's very fortunate, of course, that, that this uh, conference can happen at a time when we can travel again and get together in this kind of setting, even though we're going to go to Zoom nearly immediately, but that's part of our current life. Um, the whole project was organized uh, more specifically by Judith Delfiner, uh, who's uh, teaching at Université Paris-Nanterre and, and used to be um, uh, editor-in-chief of the um, uh, INHA journal, Perspective, and Zana Gilbert from the, the GRI. Um, and I think we have to thank them for um, having organized this um, conference. and. Now I, I leave the floor to Andrew. Merci, Eric, et bonjour. Je m'excuse de parler en anglais, mais mon père, qui était français, disait que tu parles français comme une vache espagnole. <laughs> so, in other ways, he was a nice man. But uh, <laughs> I won't subject you to uh, that. First, I want to thank our hosts, Eric de Chassy, Franz Nerlich, uh, here at Ian Achan, and Judith, who I learned yesterday, is no longer with Ian Shaw, but at Harry Nantia. Uh, I'm here primarily, I would say, for two reasons. The first and most important is that Judith and Zana have put together a wonderful conference, and I'm very excited to hear what you all have to say over the next two days and to learn more about a subject that I am not an expert, women and artists and xerography. The second, and here I'll only speak about the United States, is that it seems that research and expertise more generally is uh, under attack. And I think it's important that we support each other through collaborations like this. But I won't make this a gloomy introduction. Rather, I'll focus on the fact that this conference combines two crucial research and collecting areas of the Getty Research Institute feminism and art and technology, or art and science. Our collection of feminist artists include the papers of Eleanor Anton, Harmony Hammond, the Gorilla Girls, Cindy Nemser, Yvonne Rayner, Betty Saar, Carolee Schneeman, uh, Sylvia Slay, Barbara T. Smith, who I know we're gonna be hearing more about, uh, and Marsha Tucker. In addition, we have the archives of the performance space, The Kitchen, which include hundreds of hours of feminist performance, and the Long Beach Museum of Art's video archive, which feature most of the pioneering women video artists. Recently, we've made available material related to the Women's Building, which was a center for feminist activity on the west coast of the United States, and included a gallery, classrooms, studios, and workshops. The women were prescient enough to film most of their activities so you can actually watch the lectures, the workshops, the performances, and classes from the 1970s through the 1990s. And Zana is currently leading uh, a research project that will explore many of these archives. On art and technology, uh, our collections stretch back to the Renaissance. Recently, a scholar found in the archive an unpublished uh, pl plan by Michelangelo for the fortifications of Florence. It wasn't actually in Michelangelo's hand, but not bad. And our holdings on alchemy and the theory and technical production of color 
are among our strongest resources. But for this crowd, I imagine that it is more pertinent to mention archives like Experiments in Art and Technology, which created the famous pavilion at Osaka in 1970, and had branches in Latin America, Europe, and Asia, which have been almost unexplored, and the Aspen Design Conference, where the intersection of art and science was debated throughout the 1950s and 1960s. Uh, if any of these collections are of interest to you, I invite you to come to our archives or to apply for one of our library research grants, which provide short-term funding to use the archives, or our residential fellowships if you want to be in Los Angeles on long term. Uh, and I particularly want to call your attention that in 2024, we will have the third iteration of Pacific Standard Time on the subject of art and science, which will feature more than 60 museum exhibitions stretching from all the way from San Diego up to Santa Barbara uh, on topics such as climate change, environmental justice, science fiction, indigenous knowledge, Afrofuturism, and many other topics. So with that, uh, I want to turn things over to Judith and Zana. Thank you. Welcome to all. Um, thank you so much for being today. I, I have written the introduction in French, so, but I have the English translation on my PowerPoint. Um, Bien, bonjour à toutes et à tous. Je suis ravie de vous voir aujourd'hui pour l'ouverture de ce colloque consacré à la xérographie et aux artistes femmes. Avant toute chose, je souhaite remercier l'Institut national d'histoire de l'art et son directeur Éric de Chasset pour avoir largement soutenu le projet, mais également nos autres partenaires, le laboratoire HR de l'Université Paris de Nanterre auquel j'appartiens, euh, le Getty Research Institute, ainsi que le sort Georges Pompidou, en particulier le département film, Philippe Alain Michaud, Enrico Camporesi et Jonathan Poutier pour leur collaboration dans la conception de la projection de films associés à ce colloque. Je remercie également l'association Aware d'avoir diffusé le programme du colloque au sein de ses réseaux. Je tiens par ailleurs à remercier chaleureusement le service des manifestations et celui de la communication de l'INHA pour leur précieuse collaboration dans l'organisation de cet événement. Je remercie également Taous Damani pour son aide dans l'organisation logistique de ce colloque. Enfin, je vous remercie, vous, bien sûr, tous les participants du colloque, euh, le public, euh, d'être ici présent, euh, dans, en dépit des circonstances qui sont peu favorables au voyage en général. Alors, ce colloque a été réalisé en collaboration avec Zana Gilbert, qui n'a malheureusement pas pu se joindre à nous physiquement, mais qui introduira avec moi ces deux journées. Nous prendrons la parole à tour de rôle au cours de cette brève introduction. Good morning, everyone. Um, it's certainly morning for me. It's 1 a.m. in Los Angeles. Um, and I'm very disappointed not to be able to be with you all over the next two days. I'm heavily pregnant and therefore I'm not able to travel to be there. Um, and after postponing uh, already twice, we didn't feel we could do it again. Um, from reading all of your papers in advance, I know that this conference is going to be a fantastic and important event. Uh, and I look forward very much to watching all of the talks and discussions. I want to thank uh, you all for your contributions and also to thank Judith, who's been hard at work on the ground. It's been a pleasure to work with her over the, the previous months and after many delays during uh, due to the pandemic. We're very happy that the symposium has finally arrived. Uh, we received some sad news from Jacob Lilmos that uh, Sonia Landy Sheridan passed away last month, and we want to dedicate the symposium to her memory and her extraordinary pioneering work in the field. The history of the use of the photocopy in art has yet to be even partially written, so we're fortunate to be bringing together a range of speakers about the role of women artists in the development of the medium. We have the opportunity to write rather than rewrite an art history that fully takes into account the important contributions of women artists in this field, not as a corrective, but as a first account. As the writer Kate Icon has argued in her book, Adjusted Margin, Photocopy is a marginal media that attracted those who have been marginalized. 
I first became interested in xerography through my research on the mail art network. Uh, Xerox was one of the first mediums that revolutionized artists' ability to reproduce their works in large quantities, thus enabling an extensive sharing of information through an international network of artists via the postal system, beginning in the late 1960s. Artists, however, tended to personalize and embellish Xeroxes to enhance their intimacy across distances. In 2017, together with my former colleague John Tain at the Getty Research Institute, we started a research project on art and xerography, which comprised researching the GRI's extensive special collections holdings in this area, including, importantly, the archive of the artist Barbara T. Smith, who we'll be hearing more about through the course of the next two days. An exhibition from this archive is currently being planned at the GRI. Fascinated by printing from an early age and seeking to lighten the load of his office job, Chester Carlson successfully produced the first Xerox copy in 1938 alongside his assistant Otto Kornai. In the years after World War II, when the increase in a female workforce peaked, Xerography was popularly imagined within the purview of the office, which provided a sexist and infantilizing culture with male bosses and female secretaries. And just to give you an idea, uh, we're going to play an ad early advertisement for the technology. I can't type. I don't take dictation. I won't sharpen pencils. I can't file. My boss calls me indispensable. Miss Jones. Just a minute. Will you make a copy of this? Naturally. Push the button on the Xerox 914. I make perfect copies of whatever my boss needs by just turning a knob and pushing a button. Anything he can see, I can copy in black and white on ordinary paper. And am I fat? It's perhaps owing to this association of the machine uh, with women's work and its inscription in advertising as a technology so simple that even a woman could operate it. Women artists became some of the chief innovators in using photocopying techniques for their art. This conference hopes to explore the leading role women artists took in what has variously been known as copy art, Xerox art, photocopy art, etc. A few more words about xerography and art. Even if Carlson invented xerography as a means for copying text, it was always a visual medium. This fabled originary print impresses on us visually like some early work of conceptual art. When the technology was initially marketed by the Halloid Company, it was thought it would be used for applied art, such as transferring patterns. Artists became interested in both its reproductive and visual possibilities, leading to two major strands in the use of the technology in art. One was the publication of zines and serial works that could be cheaply and quickly produced and distributed through the mail art network or by hand, producing an unauthorized Xerox aesthetic through collage techniques. By the 1990s, photocopy was integral to the feminist movement in the form of zines, notably Riot Girl. The second strand explores the medium's visual properties and potential, and photocopy is paradoxically used to create unique but serial prints. It can be performative and time-based, at the same time intimate and reproductive. The use of xerography in art therefore crosses the genres of photo photography, performance, printmaking, artist books and zines, and time-based media. Artists gravitated to exploring the body through the uncanny register of the machine registering somatic apparitions that subverted the technology's corporate image. In the next two days, you'll hear about artists from the United States, Europe, and Latin America. But there are, of course, more experimental women artists that could be part of this discussion. And we hope that as our research continues, we'll be able to identify a fuller range of experiences. Take, for example, the way in which the imaginary of Xerox played out in Eastern Europe where access to the photocopier was greatly restricted. After years of receiving mail at Xeroxes from around the world, but herself being subject to restrictive limitations on her printing, 
Ruth Wolf Rehfeldt responded to the fall of the wall and the introduction of copy shops in East Berlin by taking her typewriter compositions to be copied in exuberant colorful stacks. These photocopies still sit in pristine boxes in her archive. Alors nous avons décidé de consacrer ce colloque aux artistes femmes qui utilisèrent la xérographie parce qu'elles furent pionnières en la matière et qu'elles développèrent une grande diversité de pratiques dans une quasi-invisibilité qui nous semble suffisamment symptomatique pour qu'on s'y intéresse de près aujourd'hui. Pour ma part, j'ai commencé à m'intéresser à ce sujet lorsque j'ai découvert un corpus totalement inédit, les xérographies de l'artiste californienne Jay Difeo, auquel j'ai consacré mon dernier manuscrit. Lorsque je pénétrais dans l'étendue et la complexité de ses œuvres, je me suis naturellement posé la question de la singularité de ce corpus, ce qui m'a conduite à entamer des recherches plus larges sur le médium depuis son invention, en examinant des œuvres d'artistes hommes comme d'artistes femmes, ainsi qu'à envisager cette pratique au regard d'autres médiums proches, notamment la photographie, dans ses développements les plus expérimentaux, en particulier le photogramme. À partir de l'étude de ce corpus spécifique, j'ai tenté de fournir une première approche théorique du médium en développant une argumentation qui prenait appui sur des questionnements fondamentaux. Pourquoi les artistes ont-ils, à un certain moment, privilégié cet outil de la reproductibilité technique qui était alors difficile d'accès, les contraignant à travailler la nuit dans les écoles d'art, dans les copy shops, voire dans des espaces qui exposaient ces machines entre deux démonstrations commerciales Pourquoi aussi cette tournée vers cet outil de la reproductibilité technique pour produire des originaux à titre d'exemple, Bruno Monari alla jusqu'à forger l'expression de xérographie originale quand Paolo Bruschi avait pour sa part l'habitude d'apposer le tampon « copie originale » sur ses compositions. Progressant dans ma recherche, je me suis rendu compte que les artistes femmes avaient expérimenté une approche du médium dans des directions inédites et qu'à cet égard, il me semblait a priori pertinent d'adopter pour son étude une perspective genrée. Parmi ce qu'on peut considérer comme l'une des spécificités de leur pratique, compte une approche de la xérographie très peu tournée vers la diffusion. La perception du médium en tant qu'outil introspectif caractérise en effet nombre d'artistes, de Barbara T. Smith à Patty Hill, en passant par Sonia Landy Sheridan, ou encore Nicole Métayer, qui ont œuvré dans un face-à-face, -face, solitaire, avec la machine, attribuant en quelque sorte à celle-ci la capacité de dévoiler quelque chose de l'ordre de l'intériorité. Une telle circulation du dehors au dedans reposait sur une conception des médias comme prolongement du système nerveux que développaient notamment les théories de Marshall McLuhan qui eurent un impact décisif sur les artistes. « En cet âge de l'électricité, » écrivait McLuhan, « nous nous voyons nous-mêmes traduits de plus en plus en information à la veille de prolonger technologiquement la conscience. » Utilisée à des fins artistiques, la xérographie se fit d'une manière générale la caisse de résonance des problématiques liées à la montée en puissance dans les années 60 de la question du médium au cœur de laquelle logeait la question des images et de leur nature. Dans une perspective formaliste, seuls les médiums traditionnels étaient susceptibles de produire des images artistiques, tandis que des technologies de la reproductibilité, au premier rang desquelles figurait la xérographie, ne pouvaient sortir que des images appartenant au champ des masses médias. On saisit alors d'autant mieux ce que pouvait receler de paradoxal, voire de polémique, la démarche des artistes considérés qui s'attachaient précisément à faire de la xérographie un médium artistique à part entière. La manifestation d'une telle tension donne à ces corpus leur saveur incomparable, mettant en scène un moment de fragilité, un point de bascule qui présente immédiatement le passage à l'ère numérique. Pareille posture qu'on fait à leur démarche, aussi singulière soit-elle, la portée d'un acte de résistance fut-il parfois inconscient et nous conforte dans l'idée que les images portent en elles quelque chose de l'ordre d'une réalité historique inexprimée. Résultant d'un usage à rebrousse-poil de la photocopieuse par lequel la machine se trouvait déroutée de sa fonctionnalité première, l'exérographie étudiée ici réintroduisait paradoxalement la dimension oratique des images. Tout se passe comme si ces artistes avaient aspiré à reprendre le contrôle sur la technologie et son inéluctable développement en redonnant une aura à ce qui par principe était censé en avoir signé la perte. En ce sens, ces images s'apparentaient sensiblement aux premières expérimentations photographiques dans lesquelles la dimension heuristique accompagnait l'apprivoisement du nouveau médium. Aux yeux de Walter Benjamin, je le cite, « Ce qui rend à ce point incomparable les premières photographies est peut-être ceci, elles sont la première image de la rencontre de la machine avec l'homme. Dans cette citation, Benjamin emploie le terme d'homme dans le sens d'être humain. Euh, 
C'est précisément une telle rencontre dont témoignent ces images, celle d'un vis-à-vis avec la machine par lequel l'artiste tente de conjurer la perte d'aura engendrée par la reproductibilité de masse. Dans une époque qui voit l'exaspération des avancées technologiques, on apprécie d'autant mieux la portée d'une telle démarche qui tenta depuis l'intérieur même de la technique d'encontrer l'automatisme afin d'en extraire quelque chose d'autre, une image qui, loin de s'éloigner de l'homme, portait l'espoir d'en révéler des territoires inédits. D'où l'idée de ce colloque qui, j'espère, fera rayonner un certain nombre de questions parmi lesquelles les femmes artistes ont-elles développé une approche spécifique du médium au point de définir une esthétique singulière Comment et avec quelles intentions les artistes sont-ils intervenus dans le procédé Quel rôle a joué la xérographie dans l'organisation féministe Quelles notions de genre ont été produites à travers ce travail, que ce soit de manière manifeste ou de manière latente Enfin, comment peut-on envisager la, perception, la persistance de cette pratique chez certaines artistes femmes aujourd'hui So we're now going to give a very brief overview of uh, the program. Uh, today's sessions will begin by taking the topic of women artists' use of photocopy within the broader context of reproduction, publishing, and feminism in the 1970s. At the first session, Women Artists, Reproduction, and Xerography hopes to set the scene of issues at stake in the conference, uh, investigate the medium's relationship to other reproductive techniques, within the context of feminist self-publishing and review a major collection of photocopy art in Spain. The second session, Alternative and Collaborative Spaces, will explore the relationship between these alternative spaces, public display and reproduction in Brazil, Mexico, and the United States. And again, attempt to sit situate xerography within broader questions of graphic design, copying, and seriality. At the end of the day, we'll look forward to a talk by Marisa Gonzalez, who is known for her use of new technologies in her work, having trained at Sonia Landy Sheridan's Generative Systems Program at the School of the Art Institute of Chicago in the 1970s. La deuxième journée de ce colloque sera dans un premier temps consacrée au face-à-face -face entre l'artiste et la machine. Cette session se concentrera sur trois figures singulières, Patty Hill, Rita Keegan and Sonia Landy Sheridan. L'après-midi sera consacré aux questions liées à l'exposition de l'image xérographique et fera intervenir différents commissaires d'exposition autour de trois projets spécifiques. L'exposition Les Immatériaux, qui s'est tenue au Centre Pompidou en 1985. L'exposition Xérographie montée à First Sight Essex en 2013. Et enfin, l'exposition consacrée à Patty Hill, organisée au Kunstverein München l'année dernière. La parole sera ensuite donnée à l'artiste new-yorkaise Camilla Jenen Rashid, qui présentera son travail récent, fondé sur la xérographie. Le colloque s'achèvera par une projection spéciale film et xérox au Centre Pompidou à 19h. Ce sera l'occasion de découvrir des films très peu connus. La projection est gratuite, vous y êtes tous chaleureusement conviés. Alors, une dernière remarque, le colloque est enregistré mais non pas diffusé en direct. Il pourra être visionné dans quelques jours, notamment sur la chaîne euh, YouTube euh, de l'INHA. Je vais maintenant passer la parole à euh, Eric Robertson, qui est professeur de culture littéraire et visuelle française de la période contemporaine à l'Université euh, Royal Holloway de Londres et qui présentera euh, notre première intervenante. Merci beaucoup. Je, je sais qu'on va parler en anglais, mais je, je profite de l'occasion pour euh, remercier euh, Zana et, et Judith, et euh, tout, enfin, très euh, particulièrement Judith, de m'avoir invité à être là aujourd'hui. Merci beaucoup. Je suis sûr que ça va euh, susciter un, un débat très important et, euh, et fascinant. 
Je passe à l'anglais. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here to um, chair this first session on the subject of um, uh, women artists' reproduction and xerography. And um, I'm delighted to present our first speaker, who is uh, Dr. Tamara Trod. She's a senior lecturer in modern and contemporary art at the University of Edinburgh. She is the author of The Art of Mechanical Reproduction, Technology and Aesthetics from Duchamp to the Digital, published by Chicago in 2015. She's also the editor of the book Screen forward slash Space, The Projected Image in Contemporary Art, published by Manchester University Press in 2011. She um, published an essay entitled Welcome, Elizabeth Price and the Life of Objects, which was published in the journal Art History in 2019. And she's currently working on an intriguing book which um, focuses on the relation between the 1930s and, uh, and now. Um, so I'm delighted to uh, ask uh, Tamara to please come and present her paper, which is entitled A, Word, A World Blown from the Bubble Chamber of a Photocopier, Helen Chadwick's Of Mutability, 1986. Good morning, everyone. Is that volume okay? You can hear me all right? Thank you so much to the organizers and to everybody. I'm really looking forward to what we're going to speak about today. I'm going to get going without further ado. I think many of the things I'll be saying will echo some of the um, ideas and arguments which have been touched on by Judith and by Zana in their excellent introduction. At the time of its invention, the photocopier was imagined as a kind of photography. Its inventor, Chester Carlson, termed it electron photography in his original patent in 1938, which I'm showing you here. This conception persisted through the years until the idea's successful commercial development 22 years later in 1960. And in fact, Xerox designed its brand name on the model of Kodak. And yet, by the time of its emergence as a commercial technology, the photocopier was primarily marketed as we've seen in that excellent <laughs> advertisement, as an aid to office bureaucracy, a means of reproducing documents. The, this dimension of the uh. utopian potential of the photocopier as a mass distribution technology was recognized at the time of its first widespread public use in the 60s by the Canadian media theorist Marshall McLuhan, <laughs> who in 1967 extolled Xerox for its potential to liberate and disseminate information Take any book on any subject and custom make your own book by simply Xeroxing a chapter. Instant steal, he wrote. So McLuhan represents the photocopier as if it were the printing press on steroids. Easy to use, easy to access, cheap or free if people could use one at work. The photocopier in his account ushers in a new age in which information can be circulated with unprecedented speed and ease. This is very much in the spirit in which it was used in the 60s and 70s by conceptual artists such as Douglas Hubler or Mel Bochner, who deployed the photocopier to assist in their efforts at dematerialization and to enable their adoption of information and documentation as structuring principles for the work of art. But what I want to focus on in this paper is something a little different, namely a utopian potential achieved by artists using the photocopier as a camera, which reaches back and earlier beyond the McLuhanite enthusiasm of the 60s into the deeper zones of Laszlo Moholy-Nagy's 
and Walter Benjamin's early theorizations of photography as a new technology for making images and so enabling new modes of thought, visual experience, and understanding. This is something that a number of women artists in particular seem to have been interested in exploring. In the work of the American artist Patty Hill, for example, in the 1970s, we see that her interest in the photocopier was not so much its duplicative function, but rather like surrealist and new vision artists of the 20s, its capacity to defamiliarize, estrange, and produce new insight into objects. The British artist Helen Chadwick, working 10 years later, demonstrates a similar interest in photocopying an extraordinary diversity of objects. Her large-scale work with the photocopier, the Oval Court, made over a period of two years between 1984 and 1986, includes photocopies of a goose, a lamb, a skate, ribbons, and many other objects, some of which had also been photocopied previously by Hill. Like Hill, Chadwick expressed a Moholinagian new vision type enthusiasm for the photo photocopier as a technology enabling new insight into the fundamentals of matter. As Imogen Ratz has reported, in her notebooks, Chadwick wrote in excited terms about photocopies as electrons. She saw the photocopy as revealing a series of traces that allow the self to be an event, an energy field, rather than matter. At the speed of light, she wrote, I no longer exist. Also like Hill, Chadwick understood photocopying as a close relation to photography and saw in photocopying the means of moving away from the hand and the autographic. Her notes describe photography as non-gestural and the photocopier as even more so. Photocopying is easier than photography, she writes, because there is no development time and you can work on your own. The photocopy is an extraordinarily direct and efficient medium, she wrote. You work on your own with no need for assistance. You just press a button and the image appears. You make the photocopy directly from life. Unlike Hill, however, Chadwick was also concerned to stage herself in her images, as we see here. While Hill expressed her desire to use the photocopier famously to get as far away as possible from myself, in the Oval Court, Chadwick combines images of her own naked body with the objects she photocopied, assembling these hundreds of fragmentary images into large-scale collages that propose, she said, ways of being in the world. I was fortunate enough to view this work recently in store at the V&A in London, and I propose to examine it in more detail with you now. So the Oval Court, was originally shown, it's an installation work, it was originally shown at the Institute for Contemporary Arts in London in 1986 as part of a larger installation called Of Mutability, which you see here, in which it was combined with another work in the adjoining room, you see here it in close up on the right, Carcass, a tall, seven foot tall glass box containing rotting food and vegetable matter. Carcass, as is well known, eventually exploded. As, <laughs> as Mark Sladen reports, Chadwick had not anticipated how actively carcass would ferment during the course of its showing at the ICA, and eventually it began to leak a foul-smelling liquid. While members of staff were attempting to move the work, the seal broke on the glass case and the lid blew off, after which the piece was removed from the exhibition. The Oval Court itself comprises hundreds of photocopies made using blue toner, then cut up and collaged together to form a series of figural compositions. The shards are quite small, few are larger than the human hand. These are laid out on blue formica panels, 60 by 60 centimetres each, screwed together, held by claw plinths and square top plinths to compose an oval platform about half a foot off the floor. The effect is as if the photocopies were floating in a blue pool composed by these panels, and Chadwick's notes refer to them as pool figures. Five large gold-painted wooden spheres are placed on top of the photocopies. 
Around the walls are hung computer drawings of Solomonic or barley sugar pillars based on the Baldacchino columns designed by Benini and St. Peter's Rome. Each pair of columns is topped by a photocopied image of Chadwick's own face crying, joined to the columns by blue-toned photocopied swags of leaves. The overall effect is a bit like a baroque ceiling overturned and tipped onto the floor. Chadwick's inspiration included sacred as well as secular baroque and rococo architecture. Her archives at the Henry Moore Institute in Leeds preserve her own albums of photographs from her visits to churches in Germany, as well as photographs of secular palaces like the Amalienberg, pictured here on your right. Her notes explain that one of the reasons for her interest in German Rococo architecture was its status as what she calls a unique Rococo, sacred and secular, inhospitable to the Enlightenment with its reverence for clear and distinct ideas. <clears throat> a further reason, I think, for Chadwick's imitation of Baroque and Rococo decorative schemes is that combined with her use of the photocopier, they enabled her to reach back to early modern meanings of copying when copia meant meaning copiousness had been a key aesthetic value praised, for example, by Erasmus. Whereas in post-romantic understandings of copying, duplication is understood to erode originality and diminish the original. In early modern Europe, the era to which Chadwick adverts in the title of her work, which references the English poet Edmund Spencer's Mutability Cantos of 1609, copia was a rhetorical science of reproduction that amplifies and intensifies through repetition. Something of this meaning of copying is suggested in Walter Benjamin's 1935-39 to essay, The Work of Art in the Age of Its Technological Reproducibility, when he writes that Unlike other methods of copying, photography can bring out new aspects of reality, producing copies which function to amplify and enlarge rather than diminish. It's that modelling of technological reproduction that I think we see Chadwick reprise and develop here, aided by her imitation of Baroque imagery of vegetable and animal proliferation. One church in particular seems to have been of use to her, is me finding it in the archive, Assamkirche in Munich. So her archive in Leeds includes this colour slide showing the oval vestibule ceiling of that church. And it seems clear that it was this ceiling which provided Chadwick with the design of her own oval court, with its central golden spheres and the massed forms of the continents in the dark sea of the ceiling, taken up by Chadwick as her own figural groups arranged in a similar oval around her own golden spheres. The composition in the pool itself comprises 12 figures. This drawing, which I photographed, well, it's an annotated photocopy of a drawing, which I photographed in the Princeton drawing room at the V&A, is helpful in showing the numbering of the figures and the order in which they appear in the installation, moving clockwise around the oval. The individual figures have not all been reproduced individually before, and they can't all be seen online. So I'm now going to show you each of them in order, using a mixture of my own photographs taken in the archives and those which are more widely available. So the first figure is this one, in which Chadwick is posed with a goose, her head bandaged. Her left arm is raised to her head, and from her right hand spills what appear to be maggots. The goose's head is pressed lightly to her breast, and on one side its foot presses against her waist, while on the other you'll see a third human hand pressing her waist tightly. Throughout the Oval Court, as we'll see, a multiplicity of hands, disembodied hands, appear, grasping materials, holding up objects, and scrambling anatomical logic. Here, the appearance of the third hand reads as if the goose were part transformed into human form, reaching out its arm to embrace her. Overall, this group themes to stage and embrace, perhaps in reference to the mythological theme of Leda and the Swan, but the scene is also deathly, with the bandages like winding cloths, the maggots, the obliterated head, and the long, viscous, shiny, eel-like form which spills out from the goose, connoting viscera or perhaps an enormous worm. The second figure is one that might be termed cornucopia. It shows a figure whose head is spewing out food. One hand clutches what seems to be a pineapple. Uh, the, a net wraps about the figure's lower thighs and lower legs. A noose is tied around one ankle with the other end of the rope tied around the figure's neck, as if in a ritual form of hobble. The image simultaneously connotes abundance, 
and vomit, waste and decay. In the third image, Chadwick's eyes are closed and her face is peaceful. She holds up a white rabbit with one arm, the other reaches above her head, holding stems of dead flowers. All around her are grouped other dead rabbits, while a furry skin is wrapped around her waist, pulled tight by a third hand. Her left foot clasps a skin in her toes, while small bones spill out around it. The pose of the figure in this group is inspired by a number of Fragonard paintings, as her, net, as her own notes attest. Drawings exist of this figure in one of Chadwick's notebooks. Again, her notes condense imagery of sex and death. Rabbit, fecundity, lust, fertility, playmate, she notes on one side of the page. Tripe, lard, bones, she writes on the other. The fourth image shows a blindfolded Chadwick holding up a mirror. In her notes, Chadwick explains that the multiple imagery in the oval court showing blindfolds or eyes wrapped and concealed is meant to indicate that the gaze should be understood as directed inwards, into feeling and sensuality of the flesh, internalized experience of pleasure, erotic intimacy floating like a dream. In the fifth image, Chadwick's figure appears to dance upside down in a weightless handstand, her head tilting up as if about to kiss the smiling face of a lamb who similarly weightless seems to dance toward her. When we see images like this, which are such coup de théâtre, which stage such impossible encounters, we might wonder how she made them. This photograph, which I found, shows us very straightforwardly. She is photocopying a dead lamb. She slightly reduced the size of the photocopies of her own body so that the images of her figure are slightly less than life size to enable her to fit more of her body onto particular images. And the objects are shown sometimes enlarged and sometimes true to scale. Figure six is shown here, displaying the artist's body in large mesh fishnet tights. There are drawings for this figure in the lead sketchbook. They show more clearly than the photocopy a large fish's head at the figure's crotch, its jaws opening wide to the smaller fishes swimming between the woman's legs. A written note alongside makes plain the sexual connotations of the figure. Vagina, legs, enclosed womb, through net, labia. The seventh figure is the only one in the group which is not a woman. Instead, it's the enlarged form of a skate shown as the same size as the woman beside it and posed, as we've seen, to appear as if it might be her prey. And it has her hands forced through at the centre of the skate, um, clutching it as if it was at the figure's waist. The eighth composition has a circular form. Chadwick, Chadwick's figure, eyes closed, appears at the right-hand side of the group, her arms raised above her head, legs extended down, so the body forms the shape of a gently curving backward C. Long strands of the seaweed called bladder rack extend from her hands and form the other curving side. The centre of the circle, itself a round form, at first might seem to resemble a moon or a planet. On closer inspection, it's revealed as the open mouth of a monkfish, monstrously enlarged. Bubbles seem to emerge from Chadwick's mouth. I think these are perhaps photocopied shells reproduced at different sizes. Spooling out from around Chadwick's neck is a long string of pearls, while from her navel, a second pearl-like string furls out, composed of ribbons and seaweed. The now familiar third disembodied hand is placed gently at Chadwick's abdomen, as if cradling her womb. Another hand clenches the white fabric at the top. Enlarged photocopies of shells with pearl, pale, curled labial edges are placed around the edges of the seam. Chadwick's name for this group in her notebooks is Pool Placenta. Her drawing on the left makes the image of the fish's head, which she terms fetus, much plainer. It's widened eyes and bared teeth staring up from the center of what she terms the whirlpool. The ninth figural group is this one, which Chadwick termed in a note, Venus, cloud, wind. Its pose seems to restage Francois Boucher's Lodelisque paintings, as others have noted. The Leeds notebook contains two pages of drawings related to it, notes which make the continued sexual theme clear. Orgasm as flight, flying, filled up with explosive erotic energy. This group is the only one to show Chadwick with her eyes open. Her cheeks are puffed out as she seems to blow air towards the dancing figures, feathers in front of her. The tenth group is one of the least photographed. It shows a smiling Chadwick, face turned to one side, her upper body and arms entangled with and battling away a storm of ribbons. 
Her legs are encased in sheer striped stockings, which in the photocopy take on the appearance of bones, as if the photocopy were an X-ray. Swags of tasseled cloth are hugged around her crotch, and a third disembodied hand is laid on her hip. A fourth hand appears near the bottom of the group, holding scissors and cutting a ribbon. This is a detail Chadwick borrowed again from Asamkirche. It appears in a sculpture of the figure of death, in which a gilded skeleton is reaching out his bony hand, holding scissors to cut the thread of life held by a chubby cherub. She had used that same detail in her first work with the photocopier, One Flesh, 1985, in which the Madonna is cutting the umbilical cord of the infant. So it's a gesture condensing life and death very directly. The 11th composition is one of the most well-known in the group and which makes particularly explicit the combination of themes of sex and fertility with death and decay. Chadwick is shown as a double-headed figure with two faces in profile turned to left and right. On the right side, we see imagery of harvest and fecundity. Her arm holds a sheaf of wheat. On the left side, her arm holds a bouquet of dead blooms and seed heads, while rags and grave cloths loosely bind her foot and lower leg. Perhaps most jarringly, her right hand pulls tight a rope which is bound around the handle of a small axe lodged upside down within her opened abdomen, its head and blade at her crotch. <clears throat> the imagery of the open abdomen seems to quote the self-portrait, The Broken Column by Frida Kahlo, about whom Chadwick made a documentary for the BBC in 1992. Kahlo's face also is bathed in tears, just like the photocopied images of Chadwick's face atop the columns which surround the pool figures in the Oval Court, and her body is swathed in bandages and fabric, like so many of Chadwick's figures in the pool. The twelfth and final figure is the least often reproduced in the whole work, and I think I've never seen it published. It shows Chadwick's body naked, contorted and knotted in an impossible anatomical puzzle. Her bottom is wedged at the centre of the composition with her back just visible arching below. Around it, her legs jut out at impossible angles, extending to the right, a puzzle enabled by her method of collaging separate photocopies together. Most strikingly, the artist's face appears just at the top with her eyes shadowed and tongue pointing out. The figure's extended tongue and multiple limbs recall Hindu representations of Kali, the mother goddess, who's understood as simultaneously all nurturing and all devouring. Aspects of Chadwick's self-imaging in the Oval Court recall some features of the work of Barbara Turner Smith in the 1960s in America. Like Chadwick and Hill, Smith used the photocopier as a camera, laying objects and fabrics on the plate to see what kinds of image would result. Like Chadwick, Smith also experimented with photocopying her own body. In some works, she photocopied herself naked or in underwear, her body pressed against the glass. The feminist statement represented by Smith's imaging of her own body her intention to express herself as a sexual being and as she described to escape the confines of heterosexual marriage may suggest a connection to the expression of female desire and pleasure which Chadwick also sought to picture in the Oval Court some 20 years later. Chadwick's notebooks and archives containing her personal collection of newspaper clippings and articles held at the Henry Moore Institute in Leeds make clear the preoccupations from which the Oval Court and of mutability emerged. There are many notes and ideas about overcoming the gaze, overcoming objectification, and women learning to feel and express desire as subjects. Seeming to sum up these interests when speaking of the Oval Court later, in an interview in 1998, Chadwick said, she'd been looking for a vocabulary of desire, where I was the subject and the object and the author. I felt that by directly taking these roles, the normal situation in which the viewer operates as a kind of voyeur broke down. But despite Chadwick's own understanding of her project as feminist, she encountered criticism from some. A review of Of Mutability by Marjorie Althorpe Guyton, published in Art Monthly in October 1986, argues it throws not only Chadwick's position into jeopardy, but it also threatens the ground recently gained by women artists and writers. The problem lies in Chadwick's use of the image of her body. In this work, the question is whether she has succeeded in representing herself as a subject of desire or has merely reduced herself to an object of visual pleasure. Seemingly sensitive to such criticisms or the possibility of them, Chadwick wrote in her notebooks, in my defense, I've attempted to map out my attachment to physicality, leaving nothing out of pleasure and pain. Emphasizing the phenomenological address she aimed for, she explained that her images aim not to capture another's gaze, but to act as mirror for another's, the viewer's own natures and desires. 
to dissolve boundaries between self and non-self, you and I. Indeed, interpretations of the Oval Court as merely repeating the sexual objectification of women would seem to miss or overlook several important features, not least the ways in which this work is addressed not to the I alone, but to a more fully embodied perception. As she wrote in her notes for a lecture on photography, I'm not really interested in creating visions. I'd rather describe being, the interpenetration of me and not me. Elsewhere, she wrote that in Of Mutability, she aimed to deconstruct the mirror phase. There is evidence that she saw the photocopier in particular as enabling this step beyond the image, offering instead the gateway to a new undifferentiated self. The photocopier is beyond specular, she wrote in notes at one point, praising the sensory quality of the photocopy, which she saw as combining the tactile and the visual, achieving an oscillation between two worlds, between object and image. Elsewhere, Chadwick describes photocopying in strongly phenomenological terms. This is not just light falling onto film, but tactile photography. In her photocopies for the Oval Court, we see her emphasizing the tactile address of the image again and again by pressing her own flesh and that of the animal she photocopied against the glass to communicate a sense of proximity and touch. Furthermore, a strong sense of the materiality of the image is communicated by the many seams which are visible in the compositions. The figural groups in the Oval Court, remember, are composed like a mosaic from hundreds and hundreds of shards of cut up and glued paper. Their edges are more than visible in the finished work. They are almost palpable, disrupting any too easy illusionism with the marks of the work's construction and introducing a sense of injury and bandaging to the figures shown. There's an additional sense of fragility in the work now, since some of the little pieces of the photocopy paper are coming away from their glue. Overall, the Oval Court produces a visible constructedness of the bodies, an open acknowledgement of the artifice of their creation, which is further heightened by the jumbled anatomy, which we've seen marks the figural compositions as a whole, with disembodied hands juxtaposed against feet and other disconnected body parts. Finally, the visible and repeated presence of death innards and decay in all of the figural groups in the work, insists on a reading that acknowledges what Chadwick intended and what she pictured in figures like the Kali or Harvest ones that I've shown, that this is a work designed to draw together powerful conceptual opposites, including pleasure and pain, self and other, and life and death, in order to break down the boundaries between them. Of mutability, after all, is not just about the female body. Importantly, the whole installation performs a staging of the self in relation to animals, fruit, flowers, and of course, the mutability of the self, which is its physical decay. Indeed, in her notebook, she wrote that she sought to create a whole world blown from the impassive bubble chamber of a photocopier. The freedom and potential this represented for her had to do with the new unconstrained model for the self, which the photocopier enabled reprising, as we've seen, early modern meanings of copia as proliferation and abundance. This new fluidity of being is made possible technologically by the photocopier's capacity to picture the body in a tactile register of imaging at near life-size scale, collaged and combined to appear alongside other things in the same space with only, as she put it, the seams betraying a feigned continuity. In his 1936 vision, version of the work of art essay, Benjamin described the cathexis of human being with technology as if photography, film, and radio formed the new hands, eyes, and ears of humanity. With these new technological organs, just as the child who is learning to grasp stretches out his hand for the moon as it would for a ball, so humanity in its efforts at innovation sets its sights on, much, on as much on presently still utopian goals as goals within reach, he wrote. In this account, Technology joined to the body as organs of the collective is what helps us articulate a sense of futurity beyond the present state of things. In Chadwick's of mutability, I think we see a furthering of that ambition, pouring the self into the machine in as if ecstatic union, attempting simultaneously to dissolve the self's boundaries and expand its possibilities. Thank you very much indeed, Tamara, for a fascinating uh, talk that um, says much not only about the, um, the finished work, but a great deal about the process and um, the complexity and the multi-layered nature of the, of the work. Now, 
Judith, if I'm not mistaken, we're going to hear all the speakers and then we will have the discussion. Okay, great. So um, hold your questions in your, you know, take notes. I'm sure you've been doing it and we will come back. So I'm delighted to present our second speaker, who is Dr. Karen DeFranco. Uh, Karen is a curator and writer working within the contexts of archives and publishing with a focus on practices that emerge between text and performance, the page and the body. Concerned with an intergenerational dialogue with these forms, Karen has curated exhibitions that challenge categorizations of archive, artwork and ephemera. And this is also the focus of her 2020 PhD called uh, Embodied Iteration, Materializing the Language of Writing and Performance in Women Artists Publishing, 1968 to 1979. Karen is currently program curator at Chelsea Space and associate lecturer for the MA in Curating and Collections, both at Chelsea College of Arts. And the title of Karen's paper is on the screen, so I shall not read it. I will <laughs> merely ask Karen to, to talk. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thanks very much. Um, thanks to Judith and to Zana in LA. You're still awake, Zana. Um, it's a real pleasure to be here. Um, thanks to everyone. Um, yes, I've been told to speak up. So can you put your hand up if you can't hear me? Which one is the amplification one? Is it this one? Or is this the recording mic? Mm -hmm. Is that better? Okay. Uh, do I do it this way? Okay. I can speak again. Can you hear me? Oh, poor Zana. <laughs> Sorry, Zana. <laughs> okay, thank you, everyone. Um, thanks so much, Tamara. That was so interesting. Um, my presentation is quite different. Um, it focuses more upon text, um, but I'm just going to get started. Um, so, critically appraised in an article in the magazine Artwrite in 1976, a group of artist books... Okay. A group of artist books made by uh, Adrian Piper, Jackie Apple, Jennifer Bartlett, Constance de Jong, Kathy Acker, Carolee Schneeman, and others were described by the writer John Howe as a collective phenomena, a kind of writing which looks like a style inside language but outside literature. Several of these books were first published as serializations or as excerpts or as republications. They were hand-produced and assembled using cheap, accessible repography, um, but later um, produced as collected works using commercial offset printing. By embracing hybrid hybridization within both material and conceptual formulations, formulation, sorry, this presentation approaches material made by Lucy Lippard, Carolee Schneeman, and Constance de Jong, and will explore how the context of writing in art practice was innovated through the disruptive introduction of fiction, specifically in work made by women, and the effects this had on the aesthetics of print reproduction. So the very context of reproductive technology, understood perhaps more broadly by the term Xerox, are aligned to others that intersect the same period, for example, the, mimeo the mimeograph, the hand-cranked predecessor to the photocopier which typifies much of the visual language of artists or small press magazines from this era. The notion of interior and exterior as positioned by Howe can be witnessed in, in this context through the materialities of self-publishing, as paper moves through the machine or presses against the glass when contact occurs between the page and ink. This flyer, which is um, located in Seth Seaglob's archive, it's descriptive of the often fictional and often provisional relationship between intention and outcome with these technologies. Siegel Lubb, like many artists, writers, and curators that I'm going to talk about, was also engaged in writing his own piece of experimental autobiographical writing at the beginning of the 1970s, 
his meta-biography titled Choices, a memoir, 1966-70, related the life of a fictional Cess Seaglob through the eyes of an anonymous narrator, who had also had a predisposition to consider the material relationship between the object and the text. So I'm just going to quote from um, this manuscript. I hope my memoirs will equal a book one inch thick by three inches wide by seven inches high, with a soft cover, no table of contents, numberless pages with margins, three quarters from the edge of the page, about six and a half ounces of my life. This manuscript, like many made by artists of this era, who were also attempting to break into commercial publishing, was emphatically rejected by the publisher E.P. Dutton with the line, we have no interest in publishing your friend's book about his book. Aside from the basic idea, I found little to capture my interest. <laughs> so I put this in because um, during the same period, uh, Lucy Lippard, who was in a relationship with Seaglub Sieg at the time, was also engaged in an attempt to produce a novel herself titled I See You Mean. The manuscript was completed around 1971 and it was eventually published in 1979. The book started as a conceptual experiment with the framework of photographic descriptions outsourced through a process of exhibition making. And um, in this case, it was the show Groups, which was held at the School of Visual Arts for a week in November 1969. So she alludes to this in um, her book, Six Years. For me, conceptual art offered a bridge between the verbal and the visual. I was writing abstract conceptual fiction then. At one point, I tried alternating pictorial and verbal paragraphs in a narrative. Nobody got it. The novel extended through the addition of materials such as diary fragments, horoscopes, and tar uh, tarot card readings into a personal document of Lippard's own feminist awakening, as experienced through her interactions with the critic and the documenter of conceptualism, as an activist and as a mother. Um, for the show groups, 30 artists were invited to photograph a group of five or more people in the same position in the same place every day for a week. Participants were asked to maintain a neutral facial positions as, as possible. The artists were then invited to write detailed descriptions of the photographs, which would accompany the images in the exhibition. This show was then um, materialized in the March 1970 edition of Studio International. And it reveals just an array, one of the arrays of strategies that Lippard employed to either generate or circulate text associated to this novel. Um, I think this is reflective of, uh, of her use of the index card as a sort of endlessly in, indeterminate text object, where the magazine operated as this kind of site of rehearsal and experimentation. Within the footnotes of Lippard's, uh, within the footnotes of um, its materialization in Studio International, um, her sort of self-reflective exposure of, of this meta-narrative intention was um, revealed in the footnotes. So it says to, to outsource the production of text for the project, um, she reveals that it's a, a personal preoccupation of selecting groups of people as the subject matter of the respondents to the photograph, as a desire to see, and I quote, the expression on people's faces would produce a kind of subliminal plot as part of the process of gathering raw data for the novel. Lippard's iterative use of print exemplifies the multiple ways and means women engage with publishing and the particular role of fiction at this time. Her turn, as she called it, to fiction writing, an activity she was supporting through the other forms of writing she was employed to do, would dispel any residual resistance she had to feminism as the process forced her to examine a woman's life in terms of personal politics. The first excerpt of this novel um, was featured in 1972 in the magazine Center, which you can see on the, um, on the slide here. Um, this was a magazine self-published and edited by the writer Carol Berger. The magazine ran from 1970 to 1984 with issues produced in editions of 200 to 450 copies. It was supported by um, the NEA through the Coordinating Council of Little Magazines from issue, to issue two, and the early editions were mimeographed and saddle-stitched, as you can see, with later issues printed offset and perfect bound. Untitled, this particular excerpt was published again, this time in um, Lippard's own essay collection from the center, Feminist Essays of Women's Art in 1976, with, additional, with the additional title Waterlay and the reinsertion of words removed from, pre from this previous iteration. 
This particular excerpt presents a preoccupation that arose from second wave feminism, which frequently drew upon the elemental imagery, um, invoking a lineage to goddess worship, worship and mythology as read through the geographical locations such as the cave. This context would engage Lippard after the novel's completion, related through the text Stone Springs, which was published in the feminist journal Heresies, and again in 1982 in Overlay, Lippard's highly experimental and influential prehistory land art anthology. When placed in comparison with an excerpt included in Unmuzzled Ox, um, another journal from 1976, it's possible to see the multiple worlds that Lippard's writing would attempt to inhabit, where the print materiality of mimeograph somehow echoes the arcane nature of the cave and offset in comparison, frames Lippard's stream of consciousness journey slash hallucination titled New York Times 2, which also featured in the novel itself. I See You Mean was published as a book in 1979 by the feminist press Chrysalis, which ran from 1977 to 1980 when it had an affiliated magazine. The company collapsed, unfortunately, shortly after, critically curtailing the sale and distribution of this book. The gap in time between the novel's completion and as a manuscript in 1971 to 72 and its publication meant the context and perhaps the motivations for writing had completely transformed. Lippard's own account of the novel in interviews afterwards have tended to describe the work as a failed experiment, as she related in, in 2017. It's evolved into a more feminist novel, still pretty unreadable, but great fun to write. Trouble is, I didn't really enjoy reading experimental novels, and I finally decided that I didn't want to spend my life writing something I, I wouldn't want to read myself. <laughs> um, funnily enough, this has actually been republished, so you can actually get a copy now um, through the publisher New Documents. It came out earlier this year. Um, and I'll, I'll maybe talk a bit about that a bit later on. Despite Lippard's own misgivings, the novel interrogated through fiction a cross-section of ideas, concerns, and politics of an era, while also experimenting and ultimately questioning what constituted writing within the realm of art and literary practice. In Artwright, the magazine firmly located in a scene that included artists such as Schneeman and De Jong, the contributor John Howe placed their work in, as representations of women's writing that, alongside Kathy Acker, Adrian Piper, Jennifer Bartlett, and Jackie Apple, could only be understood through its use of personal or personalized content by using the term emotional, where feminism was dismissed as an implicit shorthand. His criticality emphasized De Jong and Acker, um, their literary influences, for example, locating virtuosity in the writing of um, Rob Grillet or uh, Samuel Beckett, but he failed to find the same qualities in their work a position that, he, that meant he also critically failed to understand the particular uses of voice and persona in so-called confessional writing that archived women's experience. This is a mechanism developed as a safeguard in the absence of institutional or critical support. His representation, however, provides a contemporaneous perspective of the inherent interpretation of women's writing at this time, something echoed by Lucy Lippard, who remarked, what Hal doesn't seem to like about a certain women's book is exactly what I like best about it. Lippard's own 1977 article, Surprises, an anthological introduction to some women artists' books, published by Chrysalis magazine, expanded on some of the issues raised by Howe's article by focusing again on Acker, De Jong, Martha Rosler, and Jackie Apple, where Lippard makes a particular observation in regards to reading. Many of these books provoke a new way of reading. The book as a field onto which the viewer projects her own meanings is a potentially effective medium for a new kind of communication. It offers a sensibility particularly suited to a visual approach and a collage aesthetic, a fragmentation focusing on relationships between parts rather than on their stylistic peculiarities. So I'm just gonna move on to um, Carolee Schneeman. Her second artist book, um, Cezanne, she was a great painter. Oh, sorry, have you been able to see the text boxes next to the images? There's something going on with the formatting of the... 
I don't know how to get out of... Oh, okay. That one didn't have one, sorry. <laughs> oh my goodness. Uh, okay. So this second artist book, Cezanne, she was a great painter, described by Howe as an extended quarrel, was self-published under the name Trespass or Trespass Press as a first edition in 1974, with two subsequent editions in 1975. So you can see the sort of uh, composite photocopy for the, for the final edition here. Um, returning to the US from the UK in 1973, the production of Cezanne reflects a similar production of a facsimile version of her first book, Parts of a Body House Book, which she made with Boges Press in Devon in the southwest of England in 1972. Schneeman's background in publishing is related through journals such as Something, edited by David Anton, uh, Robert Kelly's Matter and Susan Sherman's Icon in the 1960s, publications that interconnected the Black Mountain, New York and San Francisco literary, poetry and performance scenes. So her background is quite diffuse in terms of um, her relationship to publishing her own work. With Beaugest, um, Schneeman made a labour intensive first edition with many handcrafted editions, parts of the Body House book which she described in the introduction as a prototype for her big book. The book was made during a period when Schneemann shifted towards solo performance after um, the performance work Thames Crawling in 1970, and, which was her last large group work, and the completion of the film Plumline, which she made from 1968 to 71, which was a work in progress that she, she started in New York and finished in um, London. The book collapses these temporalities located within these disciplines, alongside durations reproduced through her own historical and personal exchanges, combining filmmaking, painting, and writing to produce what Sue Braden in Time Out described as a published event that resembled a piece of collage film or sculptural construct compiled and overlaid with love and care. There is no perceptual logic for how the material was arranged in the book. There's no chronology, sections, or pagination. Instead, design elements introduced through the process of reproduction, such as image overprinting, illustrations, inserts, colored inks and papers, coffee stains and doodles, cohere the material visually. So I've just put some example pages to, to sort of give a, a sort of overview of what these things look like, the kinds of editions that featured in this um, particular edition. Um, the cheap second edition, which you can see at the top, um, was produced as a facsimile um, of the first edition, which was only 74, 75 copies. So this was to fulfill demand for, um, for the first book. Um, so it relied on the basic design. It basically reused the stencils that were produced by, um, for the Gestetner, uh, which is a sort of UK equivalent of a mimeograph. Um, so again, it's a kind of um, forerunner to Xerox that sort of overlaps um, between these eras of the sort of 60s and 70s and was still being used by the press throughout the 70s. Um, so what I think is interesting here is how um, Schneeman shares this particular sort of material construct when she returns to um, the US to produce um, Cezanne herself. So instead of using um, the Gestetner, she used um, what she describes as the corner offset shop um, to produce um, the book herself. Um, and all sales and distribution were handled by her, um, which replicated something of her experience with Boges Press, where the first edition of Parts of Body House book was sold by word of mouth um, through a list of her own contacts. Um, and the, the sort of um, labor-intensive relationship, I think, between distribution is something that is maybe to be discussed um, around self-publishing. A lot of material in Schneeman's archive relates to the sort of interconnected communications involved with um, sending editions to various people. But also what happens with her work is there's a sharing of material between these two publications. So not only was she ex excerpting her work um, into other journals, she was also sharing material between her own books herself which I think qualifies this relationship between what she calls a prototype for her big book, as we'll maybe discuss further. She was pursuing a contract with a commercial publisher prior to making um, parts of a body house book. So she started this, um, 
she started a relationship with a, with an agent in 1970. Um, and there's a lot of communication between them across sort of three to four years. Um, there's also several letters documenting rejections that she received from publishers such as Doubleday, um, Outer Bridge and Dien Stray, Alison and Busby and Rolling Stone. After receiving a copy of Parts of Body House book, Ed Victor at Knopp, I think that's how you pronounce it, um, wrote in May 1972, like everything you do, it's provocative, unique, sensuous, disturbing, but totally and absolutely impossible for this particular establishment, New York Publishing House, to get involved with. In response to receiving a copy of Cezanne in 1975, Ned Arnold at Liverlight remarked, I really wonder if the best form for distribution of work like this is not the various mimeographed and informally circulated printings that highly personal statements such as yours are commonly given. So as you can see, um, this is just a list of um, an outline to Joyce Johnson at the publisher McGraw Hill in New York that describes the details of both of the books, um, Suzanne and Parts of Body House book, where Suzanne, um, where she refers to the printing of Suzanne at the corner offset shop and selling it by word of mouth via Yap Reitman's um, 8th Street and Gotham Books. So this is a, a kind of example of the visual nature of um, the circulation of this material, but also the intensity um, the intensity that it reproduced within the um, artist's own work. So just moving on to, oh, sorry. <laughs> I inserted this image this morning um, because I thought it was important to denote that um, she also used Cezanne um, within her own performances. So um, in the sort of very seminal performance interior scroll, um, before revealing the scroll from her vagina, um, Schneeman reads um, a text from um, Suzanne. She was a great painter. So there's images of her holding the book and reading from it. And the material was then folded into the, the, um, the publication itself. So these are the, just the, the, the print briefs um, that she produced um, to then photocopy afterwards. So um, this is the last example that I'm going to discuss. Um, Constance de Jong's serial artist book, The Complete Works of Constance de Jong, from one to five, was written and published by the artist between June 1975 and June 1976. As five independent, yet interconnected publications. Influenced by literature rather than art, from European writers such as Jean Cocteau, uh, Rob Grillet, which seemed to influence everyone, Marguerite Duras, um, and also her friend Kathy Acker, um, who was also obsessed with Gertrude Stein, for whom language was material, among other things. Um, both Dujong and Acker's writing would problematize designations of narrative and prose forms through the interventions of embodied language, where speech transformed from the page through the body into the performance space. The confluence of this experimentation produced a situation where the speaking subject rejected the confines of representation to disappear into language itself. As a consequence, the preparation and shape of text formations act as a location from which De Jong materialized presence, meaning that, meaning that attention is dispersed across an array of materials, punctuated in time through acts of performance. Shifting between live event and publication, De, Jong work, De Jong's work presents a relationship to categorization. This is ambiguous precisely due to the editorial and design procedures generated to produce her writing. So the serial books were originally typed on an IBM Selectrix typewriter with the, um, by the artist, with the resulting manuscripts printed directly using photo offset. The books are quite small, the 21 by 18 centimeters. They're simply presented with an unadorned shiny blue cover described by the artist as a salute to Eve Klein. They're printed on white uncoated stock, the typeface um, is the IBM equivalent to Palladium, which is retained across the five publications, as is the pagination, which runs continuously. Book one was published by um, the Vanishing Rotating Triangle Press, or TVRT, in 1975. This was a press established by the writer Ted Castle and the artist Leandro Katz, with the financial support from Solar Wit. They were introduced to Dijon through her friendship with Kathy Acker. As Dujong's concept for the uh, project developed, she founded her own press called Mirror Press Incorporated 
and produced the subsequent um, editions two to five by herself between 75 to 76. Each book was produced in an edition of 500 and they were sent by the artist to, uh, to a mailing list using the office, offices and distribution setup of art services that was run by Mimi Johnson, who was a friend of hers. It was again through Acker that De Jong found the idea of distributing her books by post, as Acker had also done something similar with her serialized book, The Childlike Life of the Black Tarantula in 1973, using um, a mailing list that apparently came to her through Eleanor Anton, who was a friend. So De Jong would reflect that the process of making her own books with the development of inexpensive printing methods was a practice more engaged by the poetry community as well as journals and political movements, yet relatively rare for works of fiction. And she voiced the concern of inflicting her work on the unsuspecting recipients. So this is to say that these people weren't expecting these materials, they hadn't ordered them, they were sent anonymously to people through the post. So without the services, um, so she said that she was hesitant to contribute to the growing proliferation of printed matter, especially in its least desirable form, junk mail. Without the services of a publisher, however, it was the only way to circulate the material rather than put it in a drawer. And in addition, it meant that she avoided the slow moving mechanisms of the commercial publishing environment. As we can tell from previous <laughs> things that I've talked about, um, this, you know, this has affected women writers from all areas, um, stating the difficulties. So she stated the difficulties publishers having in accepting and promoting new work, especially fiction, especially fiction by an online writer. During the period that the five books were made, the text was structured by De Jong into a series of spoken word performances beginning at the kitchen on Sunday, on Sunday the 25th of January, 1976, an evening has that been up for ages? Okay, sorry. <laughs> um, an evening that was shared with Cathy Acker, which continued to Paris and London. I'm going to whiz through this. With the books now complete, the performance was titled Modern Love, and iterations took place in Paris on the 2nd of November and at the Women's Free Arts Alliance in London on the 11th of November 1976 by the invitation of the writer and critic Barbara Rice. De Jong performed again at the kitchen. After publishing the last book at the series, she um, visited Paris with the unsuccessful hope of securing a publisher for the complete manuscript. Instead, she started her own press again called Standard Editions with the support of the surrealist artist Dorothea Tanning, who was the aunt of her friend Mimi Johnson. Standard Editions published the complete works of Constance De Jong 1 to 5 as a single edition at the end of 1977, retitled Modern Love. So each example I've touched upon here, and just to say it's not possible to go into every detail of every single iteration or um, republication of all the materials discussed. Um, sorry. <laughs> iteration of material configured or published within artistic or poetry journals or magazine complicates, extends, and enlivens the histories of writing and publishing within the context of art and literary practice. These are mobile and contingent materials that adapt to the conditions of production, drawing upon the mutable qualities reproduction offers, redistributed through a variety of indexical or nominal for, for, um, formations, into textually subversive associations between the social condition of language and representation, materialized as heterogeneous encounters, performance, installation, reading, exhibition and back into published forms that continue the discursive process through distributed networks of exchange, furthering the dialogue of circulation. Each example has explored the paradox of dematerialization through the question of presence within language. Many, many women equally struggled against the enforced invisibility from other sectors of the art world. They recall Gertrude Stein, where each project has emphasized the production of writing and reading as a simultaneous experience or a continuous present, where the process of seeing is inseparable from the processes of saying where typographical and editorial treatments are inscribed as having a non-hierarchical relationship to language, language's very syntax, through the horizontal composition of, uh, pr of prose, where revision operated as a performative activity that was additionally invested in the transition and intervention of language into conventional forms. Can I just finish my last paragraph? Okay. <laughs> 
Words can exist alongside or fuse with and become performance, notations of a found or original or a whole or excerpted nature, which can indicate something other than the narrative we know as fiction. Or prose fiction can address the reader as non-fiction, the line between speculation and fact dissolved or forgotten. Fiction is therefore woven along with other forms and strategies of making, responding to the interdisciplinary and discursive nature of dematerialized practices. By examining these forms of together according to their particular combination of qualities, rather than what they borrow from other disciplinary traditions, allows for an articulation that is perhaps constitutive of a distinct genre that belongs neither to prose nor performance, but as both archive and repertoire. Um, thank you very much. I'm so sorry. Thank you very much indeed, Karen, for taking the, um, taking the discussion in, a, in an important direction there and bringing a whole other element in. I was once on, on the bill after Carolee Schneemann. Can you believe that? It was in New York in a gallery. And it was, it was, a, it was called um, White Box in lower Manhattan and it was called textual operations and there was a series of speakers and I was sandwiched between Carolee Schneemann and Marjorie Perloff I was clearly the weak link anyway yeah. I'm very pleased to introduce our third and for this session final speaker, um, who is Jose Alcala, who is a multimedia artist, curator, and author. He's professor of art and new media at the Faculty of Fine Arts at the University of Castilla-La Mancha in Cuenca. He was the founding director of Mideciant. Is that how you pronounce it? Mideciant. Mideciant. Yeah. In the International Museum of Electrography, which is also in Cuenca. And until, nine, uh, until 2018, he was coordinator of collections and archives of contemporary art at the Faculty of Fine Art. Um, among his many roles and distinctions, he is vice president of the Spanish Contemporary Art Institute. He is also co-director of the Ibero-American Observatory of Digital and Electronic Arts, as well as being director of the international journal, ASRI. Um, I don't have the, the full spelt out um, version of ASRI, but you can yeah, maybe... Is that, yes. ASRI is ASRI. Art Society Research uh, Magazine. Ah, oh, good, <laughs> thank you. And um, Jose's paper today, uh, as you can see, is going to be focusing on pioneering women of copy art in the collection of the Cuenca International Museum of Electrography in Spain. Over to you. Jose. Thank you very much. Okay, it's, it's really a pleasure to be here. Thank you very much, Sana and, and Judith, uh, to organize this very important uh, symposium. Very important because it's really important to put story of uh, copy art and media art in the uh, general story of the contemporary art. It's not done, we must do it. So this is very important to meet all together, to meet one to each other and to exchange ideas, resources, etc. So that's what I'm going to do, just to add my personal and human uh, contribution. Uh, to start to, to, to talk to this, um, I, I, I want to introduce with, well, so apologize for my, my, my English is not so fluid, so it's not very fluent, so I, I'll try to do my best, okay? Anyway, I'll try to, to explain with some passion, so that's, that's better. Uh, I, I start with, uh, I begin with, uh, with a personal uh, story. The story is, in 1982, I was a student in the Faculty of Fine Arts in Valencia, in Spain, and I met uh, a colleague, it's called Fernando Canales, and then we start uh, using photocopy machines, or Xerox machines, to create our, uh, our uh, uh, 
academic uh, wo art works, just to remove the academy okay, of arts. Uh, it was success, and we moved ahead. And then in 1984, we start doing our our doc, our th thesis of final final what is called the final exercises of the grade. Uh, and then uh, we met. Uh, uh, we met um, Marisa Gonzalez, who is here. Uh, she was a pioneer. She came from 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 the states. Uh, she she was a student from Sonia Serian, but also a big friend of her. And 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 she started talking about about Sonia and about all these things. So we really uh, uh, got very very interested in, in going ahead, and we start uh, teaching in, in workshops to the young students. And, and then making exhibitions. And in 1984, we, uh, uh, we participate in the first Biennale of Copy Art, organized by um, Pascual Ford, uh, the Gallery Ford in Barcelona. Uh, that was a big success because many of the pioneer artists of Copy Art and serography participate with their own uh, work, artworks. Uh, we participate also as, as artists. Um, Three years later, in 88, uh, Fernando and me organized the second international biennial of electrography and copy art. We add electrography. And it was a big success, and, and many, many artists, not only the pioneers, but now what we call the second generation of copy artists, uh, participate. We create uh, workshops, uh, um, uh, seminars, films, exhibitions, and we invited 15 artists from all around the world. This was very important because uh, this was the first time that we feel as a part of a community. So there, there was a international community of copy artists where women artists were very important in that time. Um, so we start moving, and a year later of the Biennale of Valencia, uh, Luis Monforte organized uh, Biennial of Electrography, an exhibition, a, a, a big festival of, of copy art inside the Biennial of Sao Paulo, in Sao Paulo Biennial, the 20th Sao Paulo Biennial. So we start moving all around the world as nomads, artists, meeting one to each other. There were not internet in that time, but was very impressed. So uh, that what happened is that, uh, uh, okay, we, we, we start uh, um, teaching around this to uh, these four important technologies, what we call modern machines. Modern machines means automatical and instant machines. So this is the difference. It's not photography, because photography is mechanical, but it's not automatic. So in this, not instant, it means. So in this case, Xerox, uh, the graphic user interface, the um, Polaroid, and the Sony uh, uh, Portapa camera, video camera, were, you know, this from 59, to 67, uh, the, the, the start, uh, artists start using technology, using machines in a creative way, and start developing what will be the, the current uh, uh, movement, the current languages of, of what we call the technical images. So that was the idea. With that idea, I was invited by the University of Castilla-La Mancha to set up a department of media art, a media art department. I was only uh, 28 years old, but I, I, I became professor very, very soon, uh, the head professor of media art in that university. And one year later, one year after being inside this university, um, the rector of the university asked me if he had received a letter from Christian Rigal and Klaus Urbons, who were very important uh, uh, artists and theoretical uh, people uh, related to copy art and electrography. And they wrote to my rector, say, uh, Jose Ramon Alcalá has the two important collections of the first and second Biennale of electrography, and it should be a good idea to set up a museum, a museum of copy art. So the rector tell me, asked me, is it possible? Would you mind to, to create a, a, a museum? And I did it, but I did it with just one condition, that it was not only a, a, a museum, but also a kind of a workshop, okay? So in 1989, I founded the Mide Cian inside the University of Castilla-La Mancha. Mide at the beginning, but then it was also an innovation center for art and technology, so it's Cian, Mide Cian. So we started with these two collections of pioneers, artists, 
and, and some others, artist donations from artists from this international community of copy artists. And, and we develop a kind of, uh, you know, first uh, university media lab, okay? Second, uh, public museums, but also, and this is the important idea, an artist run space. Artist run space was the great idea. The, the MIDE should be the home, a house for everybody, every artist who wants to come all around the world and install there and just develop ideas. To do that, we had to create agreements between uh, um, as Sonia, we were inspired by Sonia. This is, this, my presentation is a tribute to, to Sonia Seridan, of course, because, uh, you know, she was so important for all of us. And, and the spirit of Sonia Sheridan uh, was, okay, you go to the companies, you ask for technology, you put the technology for free, access to the artists, and then that will be the house for everybody. And that was a big success because then we, uh, create a very interesting combination between high tech and a very, very natural surroundings, you know, because Cuenca was so beautiful. Uh, the, the research slides I will show you now, were new imaginaries, so uh, technical images in art, um, new media art, which would be like now media art histories, what we are doing nowadays, and also ICTS, no? Art, Science and Technology and Society, which is uh, in the interdisciplinary creativity. Um, because the media was not a museum of copy art, but it was a museum of electrography, it means electrographics. So we keep going 35 years, you know, just uh, going ahead, updated technologies, processes, art languages, etc., inviting people. This was the first uh, place for the museum. The museum was in Cuenca. Cuenca is a beautiful place in the middle between Madrid and Valencia. It's only 50 minutes in a fast, uh, fast train from Madrid and also from Valencia. And it's in beauty, beauty, very beautiful uh, surroundings with two rivers and a canyon. And in the top of the canyon is the, the, the historical place, the historical city where it was based. The, the middle was based in a Carmelite convent, recently restored in 1988 by the uh, government of the Castilla-La Mancha. And the government let us, let the university, this building to set up the, the museum. So the museum was an incredible space full of the 500 pieces in the origin. Now we have 11,000 pieces, okay? Uh, stored and digitalized and put it in the website. And um, the, 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 the media was absolutely beautiful. Uh, artists, you know, really in love with the, with, the, with the place and start living there, coming from Japan, the state, uh, uh, Germany, uh, France, whatever, okay? And, and the, these, these pieces, you know, were just the first attempt to create a story of uh, serography art. Okay, it was the first attempt, uh, but it was also workshop. So the, the high tech in that moment, you know, the CLC one, the, the first color copier was there and everybody wants to come to use for free this copy machine, no? that was so expensive and it was really a joyful, it was so joyful that everybody were there, we organized seminars, etc., and also start working with computers, Photoshop, etc. And, 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 and we create also a, a research center. The research center had in the physical times, of course, you know, papers and papers and papers full of, of catalogs, books, etc. you know, where everything were compiled uh, from our um, network of, of, of museums, of centers, like the Montreal Copy Art Center, or like Banff Center, or the Fundación Laniel Langlois, uh, on Canada, uh, Milano Serographica Center, Museum Full Photocopy from, from Mulheim Rua in German. That was our colleagues, the, first, the people that were doing exactly the same and we were exchanging to them. Unfortunately, the government took out this building, this beautiful building, and all the, all the, uh, the works should be stored, you know, stored in this place. This is a nice place, but Every, all, the, all the works are stored. But what is very nice and very interesting is that every week, a lot of buses crowded of students of fine arts schools are coming, you know, just to visit the stores, sit on the floor, and I'm, you know, hung, the, the filling cabinets, you know, just put it out and, and, and tell to them my personal story of the growing up of 
copy and media art. Okay, this is the idea. You know, so so the you know these are you know uh, the, the, the 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 cabinets. You know, the field cabinets full of of crowded of of works that are all organized by historical ideas, conceptual ideas, etc., and where the presence of of uh, of uh, women artists are really important. This is our our personal media art classification. This is very important because nowadays, among these. Um, uh, 11,000 pieces of the collections is all around this. We have pieces with telematics of multimedia, 3D animation, robotics, industrial design, but what we are talking now, what we are specifying is digital graphics. So the part, the collection, because there are five important collections in the media nowadays, is copy art collection, fax art collection, digital um, digital printing collection, and a net art collection, and the uh, ma media art collection, which is called electronic and, and digital, uh, other things. But now we are specifying, uh, talking about digital graphic, okay, where copy art and fax art is, is based on. So mm, I want to talk about the relevance of pioneering women, but I would like to start talking about a woman who was our inspiration, but was not an artist, okay? And for me, it's important to tell you this because we need to put in the official history a kind of a parallel histories that are not the hegemonic histories. You know, the hegemonic history is Chester Carson invented serography. Yes, of course. But what's about Marcel de Meloner, Belgian inventor, patent? Or what's about Edith Weide? Edith Weide was an incredible person. Uh, in 1932 until 1966, she was the Leverkusen Agfa photo paper plant chemist director. Okay? In, the, in between their own uh, events are, for example, Agfa Hebert silver cell diffusion transfer method, what is called copy rapid, in 1932. Agfa color papers, the first color papers in 1937. Akfa Heber Instant Films, uh, the, 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 you know, pioneer from, from, from Instagram, uh, which, is a copy, uh, which is also called uh, Instant Cameras in the 40s. Uh, Akfa Quick Copy Papers in 49. And also all of them uh, was, the, the, all of them paved the way for the first photocopiers, Instant Mechanical Reproduction System and Instant Copy. It was amazing because I discovered this women in 1988. I was doing my doctoral thesis in, in copy art history, and I, I traveled to visit my colleague Klaus Urbans in Mulheim Ruhr, and Klaus said, I have a present for you. This is a gift. I found the location of uh, Edith Weide, and we are going to visit her. It was 1988. It was in the middle of the Black Forest in Germany. And we take a small car and we go there and we visit this incredible woman, you know, that was that. This is my picture, okay? I took this picture one year before she died. This is Klaus Urbos and that's me, okay? Uh, Edith Weide starts showing us the whole inventions that she direct and, 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 and coordinate and, and leading in the 30s and the 40s. was incredible to take in the hand the first error, you know, of, of a copy paper that got the idea of producing copy machine, a copy, a copy process, a, a direct, a fast copy process. Uh, this is the, the paper, this is historical paper. And, and, and we uh, published this book just uh, two years ago. Uh, from, uh, you know, uh, Dickel, Urban, such uh, uh, and me, I mean myself. And this is published, you can read all the history of this women inventor, women leading of, of the technology that provide us to use these shadowgraphy techniques. You must understand that in, after the Second World War, the patents of Germany were for free. So, uh, Carlson was an uh, attorney of an uh, 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 office of patents. So she, he knew perfectly the patent of the copy instant from ACFA, and he started using that you know, and developing. 
So it's important to, to understand the story why, you know, and, and, and for me it's very impressive and very, very amazing that a woman was in the middle of the invention, you know, was the really pioneer of all this technology. Okay, this is was just a gift for you. <laughs> 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 now we go to art, okay? And, and if we talk about art, we need to understand that I have a classic, uh, you'll see a classification. We, um, first generation of pioneers and second generation, I am part of this second generation, okay? We were students of the first generation people, okay? And then the third generation, which arrived until the, the, the 2000. Um, all of these were developing these discourses, uh, especially in women uh, productions, like for example, politics, social activist movement, identity, new visions of gender, a language, the development of new languages of the technical images filtered by feminine visions, and research, just research, new media art practices as interdisciplinary research. These four guides, these four lines start, you know, with some generations of, of artists that I, I should do this because what's important in the media, in our museum, to clarify, to have a story about um, art, artworks in the collections organized historically. So in that case, I'm going to show you some of the more significant uh, uh, artists present in, the, in, the, in this uh, collection. Eleanor Ken, Shonia Sheridan, Patty Hill, Sarah Jackson, Sheila Pinkel, Luis Netherland, Dina Dar, Amal Abdenur, Marisa Gonzalez. These are for me the, the most representative pioneer artists in our collection, in the collection of Mide. Uh, first, uh, Sonia Sheridan. I must talk about Sonia Sheridan. It's a tribute to Sonia Sheridan because she passed away just 10 days ago. And, and, and it's so important, the reflections. Uh, Sonia Sheridan was in parallel to Andy Warhol. Every machine she took, you know, had any brilliant idea, you know, to develop. Uh, but she started like uh, uh, activism uh, because she was a teacher of silk screen, silk screen art. So she, teach, uh, she, she was teaching at the uh, Chicago uh, uh, school, uh, skill, skill screen. But near Chicago was uh, the 3M company developing the 3M color in color. So she had a, 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 a founded, uh, she, she was founded by them and went and spent some time uh, using these machines in the 3M company. So finally, this, uh, she got an agreement, I think the first agreement in the history of art between artists, academy, and uh, corporations, technological corporations. So uh, 3M put on the uh, uh, Chicago school uh, a lot of machines, faxes, uh, copies, etc. Uh, that, that Sonia Serena started developing. This is Sonia. Sonia was so curious gay all the time, you know. Well, Marisa can tell much more and, and more profoundly, but I'm just a briefly story, you know, just tell how I uh, appreciate, uh, how I feel uh, uh, Sonia just putting her body everywhere, everywhere, every machine she found, no? And, and how she was also teaching. This is the ha haloid model, the, the A model of the haloid Xerox. This is haloid, is, the, is before the 914. So it's a, it's, it's a manual copy machine. Uh, Klaus Urban donated to the museum in Cuenca one of these. And for 10 years we were teaching, we were giving seminars, workshops, uh, where artists and students could use this machine in the, in the 90s, the, when the machine is in the 50s. So it was interesting, you know, how to use this manual serography, you know, as Sonia uh, guide us, no, uh, teach us. And Sonia uh, took all these uh, four or five uh, discourses, speeches, no, with the body. For me, this is very important. This is a piece I'm going to show in a huge exhibition uh, uh, December in Valencia. It's called Artists and Machines. The, the, the dialogues in the beginning of the digital art, where I put in dialogue uh, in video art pieces, net art pieces, and copy art pieces. You know, dialoguing about same concepts. And one of the concepts is this. This is, this is a genius. Sonia was a genius. You know, take a copy, make a copy of her hand with seeds. You know, take the copy, scratch the copy, put again in there, and make a copy. So this is the scratch copy of a copy. 
you know. This is important thing because a copy of a copy of a copy of a copy is a copy. But in this case, this is a multiple because this is a scratch copy of a copy. So this idea is very clever, you know, and, 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 and really revolutionized our, our conception of what means original, copy, and multiple, okay? And I start working with, with the relations between chemical, uh, um, light, and, and, and how machine can imagine, can transport it, because the main idea of, of Shonia was to start talking about process. It's the first time I heard process in the, in the, in the words of Marisa Gonzalez talking about Shonia's teaching process. The process was so important, and she said generative systems. She founded the generative system program. So the idea of generative system is the idea of going from objects to processes. And this is the important main, you know, because machines are mainly process. So you can access to the process, and what is really interesting is to capture the process. So process of what? What everything, how light is moving, how things are chemically in distortion or, or mattering, uh, how everything, you know? So, so Sonia start also working with the idea of telematics, you know, a sound, a via sound, for example, this image, no? Imaging a hand via sound. How sounds can modify, can contribute to create art, to create a copy, to create something graphic. And this is a very important idea because mixing sound, image, you know, graphics, it's, it's a new idea, a very potential idea in the meaning of generative system, in the meaning of, of processing. Also, the first computers, you know, using ASCII, ASCII, ASCII language, you know, the first one of the, the, the programming languages of, 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 of uh, computer art. And, and this is the most important thing. How, uh, how uh, a class of, a classroom in a faculty of art is not full of, 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 of oil on canvas and cavalets, but you know, full of machines where many, many people are, the students are dominating things like sound, like audiovisual, like whatever, you know, and all mixed together, you know. This is, this is a nice uh, picture from the, 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 the 70s in, in Psych where Marisa was a student too. Uh, and, and this is the idea of, of, of the relation. These are the important people from the 3M company, okay? So, so it's interesting. Uh, she donated to us this piece from the original in the 70s, and, and, and we received in the MIDE, and I am here with the piece, the original piece of the 70s produced by them. So the, the generations are, uh, for me, Marisa Gonzalez. Uh, Marisa Gonzalez, they tell me that I have to conclude, so I, I, I have to go fast. You know, just showing uh, some images from, from, from the artists in the collection of Mide Ciant, uh, and you can see some of, of the imaginarium that we are moving in, in that we are, we are collecting and we are storing, because the most important thing is to create a story. Uh, these are, this is, for me, the modern still life. A modern still life is a copy of something you have in your pockets, put in the copy machine and press the bottom. You know, there is no shadow, there is no perspective, there is no... This is the modern, the avant-garde, the updated uh, uh, life, uh, still life, okay? And, and for example, Dina Dar, uh, a red rose in a red toner with a red uh, paper. That's interesting thing, no? Or, or, or for example, Sheila Pinkel, or for example, Louis Netherland, you know, with the ISCA, the International Society of Copy Artists, you know, the ISCA Quarterly was very interesting. Amal Abdenur made an incredible, incredible work because she, she, was, she was copulating with the machine. So the, 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 the baby of, from the copulation between, Shonia, between Amal and, and the machine was the copy. Okay, and that's the copy of her, of her body. It's similar than, than Nellen Chadwick, but in this case it's more, you know what I mean, most direct, straight on to the, to the idea, no? to the concept. And, and okay, the pioneers, the pioneers, uh, that was very important, the pioneers publishing, you know, copy art, the, guy, the first guy copy art of the copy machines from Patrick Firpo in the 70s, because we found a lot of an intellectual works of the copy art in, 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 in Dijon, in, in France, in 84. That was so important because I, I, I write, I, 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 for this conference, I, I try to write the whole numbers of 
women artists present in these catalogs, in these exhibitions. And there are so many of them. You can see some of them that were present, you know, and most of them are in our, in our collections. The second generation, the second generation is important, no? No time to second generation? Okay, so the second generation is... <laughs> I was so enjoyable. <laughs> I'm having fun. <laughs> okay, but it, it's important to know there is a second generation. Which is the second generation? Women that start constructing the language, the specific language of serography. You know, pioneers was just uh, experimenting, okay, so researching. But these guys were, you know, just um, organizing the, the language. And, you know, for example, Lee Prince, very important, the performance of Lee Prince had a lot of problems with law, uh, also forbidden, uh, because using uh, young people, to, uh, her, her, do her daughters to, to be in the, in the copy machine, nude, you know, like this. Uh, Lee Prince, uh, for me, Ariane Tessé is so important, you know, to, to make a metaphor, so powerful metaphor of their own body, saying seven days, seven masks. And seven masks, seven uh, bodies. You know, uh, women as artists, women as fem women as mother, women as professional, women as as, as a lover. You know, and, and every every day, every night, I took off my, uh, uh, my 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 body and I put it there. And the transfer process to from from ser serography is very important because it's using this uh, PVC, you know, material, which is a very nice material to to produce a so powerful metaphors of, of of how a woman see herself, you know, just being uh, seven women every day of the of the week, no? And Anne Sharp, uh, Barbara Verhoeven, uh, Betty Dannon, um, Kathy Lee Craft. Uh, there are some of the works, uh, Judy Thomas. These are the most significant uh, artworks in the collection of Mide, no? Uh, this is an incredible piece of uh, uh, scale one-to-one, -one, uh, coming from the printing uh, area, that's important, silly green, coming from printing art. Or oh, Marie-Hélène Robert, it's so interesting to do this with sinotype. Sino it's a sinotype, so it means the conditions were I donated to the Mide, but Every month, when the image with a high light disappears, you just take off. So you have a year to show these pieces because at the end of the year, the, the whole 12 uh, papers will be gone because the light will stay down. So it's a, it's a special donation because it's a temporal donation. It means it's only going to a, a, a take a life of 12, year, 12 months. You know, that was very interesting. So uh, Victoria Sina did something similar. Eta Norros from Norris, very important. Paloma Navares from Spain, friend of, of Marisa Gonzalez. I'm working a lot with her. Uh, Paloma Navares made beautiful. This is in the, in the Thyssen, Museum Thyssen. So it's important to know that serography is a start going inside the, 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 the traditional important museums of art, you know, like Thyssen Museum in Madrid, where it's mixing with serography from Paloma Navares, which is a dialogue between, between all of them, or Yuri Nagawara from, from Japan, make beautiful, beautiful installations. And the very, very young students and artists, uh, women artists from Spain, like Teresa Magal, Equipo de Quedeque, who was crazy team, you know, crazy team of, of young women, you know, just copying all the world. Everything in front of it was copying, you know, and just putting and, and producing this kind of, of, of uh, uh, posters, you know, and flyers that make image into the Valencian night, the famous Valencian nights, okay, of, of, of disco, discotheques, etc. cetera, no? and how they re renew the, the iconography of, of, the, of the Jonas life, you know, the, the steel of life of people, of young people, all these uh, crazy equipo limite also just where their cells, you know, were providing a pop art. Okay, I think this, this is enough. Uh, there are many of them, conclude, of course. Thank you very much. <laughs> That's what I can do. Thank you very much indeed, Jose, both for sharing some of your clearly encyclopedic knowledge and also for making us realize that for all its grand history, Cuenca is clearly at the cutting edge of, of the avant-garde. You know, that's a remarkable uh, 
state of play, isn't it? I mean, quite a quite a, a forward looking and, and very daring initiative. So thank you so much. Thank you to all three speakers um, who covered a huge amount of ground. Um, so have you all got a microphone? I think you should. Uh, ah. ah, OK. Perfect. Um, well, we've got time for questions, discussion. Um, I would be, uh, I will be on the lookout for anyone who has a question, and I believe the microphone is going to be um, brought around the room. So, can I take a first question? Yes, from Andrew. I think it's Andrew, isn't it? Behind the mask. Yes. Tomorrow, I was really fascinated by the Helen Chadwick. Um, because it complicates, admittedly, a very ignorant history I have of British uh, art, which, you know, I was always taught that after the history group, uh, that these connections of the naked woman body and uh, nature, fertility, uh, were, you know, that were banned from uh, British feminism, but I wonder about if you could say more about the reception of Chadwick, but also how she very much American context would be the sort of goddess work of the of the seventies and how she a decade because it it feels very different, though some of the imagery is similar. So how she brings some of these things into a very different context in the 80s. I think there was some interest. Is that microphone OK? I think there was interest um, in amongst British feminism in goddess imagery. And um, and I think in the archives in Leeds, there's, her, there's many notes. One I'm thinking of in particular is she attended a conference on monuments and maidens, at which Marina Warner was speaking. And Marina Warner obviously is an incredibly important scholar and historian of the female image. And Helen Chadwick wrote to Marina Warner after that, saying, would you write for my work? And um, Marina originally, it seems, said no, because the letter that I've got, that I've seen in the, in the archives is, um, is uh, her writing again to say, please, no, but really, please, would you, you know? And Marina Warner obviously said yes, because then she became one of the most important writers about Helen Chadwick's work. So in other words, I think that strand is there within British feminism. But it's definitely the case that uh, there was also a sense of prohibition on the female image that Helen Chadwick obviously engaged with in the notes that I quoted where she writes, in my defense, you know, and that she had this hostile review. The only one I've found is by Marjorie Althorpe Guyton that I quoted. Uh, but there is reference in the literature to other criticisms, but I need to pursue that because I haven't found that in the printed literature that I've seen. Um, nevertheless, what is perhaps the saddest indication of the mark that this criticism or this reception, which perhaps was verbal if it wasn't printed, th that it made on Chadwick, is that she stopped representing her body on the outside and after of mutability her work goes in and she uses medical imaging techniques to produce works like viral landscapes and blood hyphen. So she uses works where she you know, uses imaging from the interior of the body and doesn't represent the outside surfaces of the body. And it, I mean, it does seem a little sad, uh, but it was, uh, it was the journey that she went on. It was the, the, that's what happened next in her work. And of course she died young, so we don't know what would have happened next. Uh, so you get this a false sense of closure, you know, that she went away and she never went back to it. But, you know, she was cut short. So who knows what would have happened next? Yes, we have a question at the back of the room. Um, I was wondering if um, uh, we have to see uh, with um, copy art, the body, or only the body, or also the technique. So do we have to analyze this only uh, what we can see with this technique, or do we have to analyze also the technique? 
I don't know if it's clear or not. Yeah, this is a very. Oui, bien sûr. Pardon. En fait, je me demandais si euh, on devait seulement regarder le corps à travers la technique ou regarder aussi la technique à travers le corps, en fait. Si c'était seulement interpréter euh, ce que l'artiste femme fait avec son corps ou également interpréter ce qu'elle fait à travers cette technique, puisque, enfin, euh, si je ne me trompe pas, euh, Madame Trod avait dit que euh, au début, euh, la copie, on faisait de la copie au début pour euh, chercher à aller dans l'originalité, et ensuite là, avec la photocopie, la copie devient, c'est plus une copie euh, scientifique, et on n'est plus vraiment dans l'originalité. Sauf que, en soi, on peut dire que, euh, à travers cette démarche scientifique, on passe quand même à l'originalité en fait is it clear if i can just interject i think it's a question about form and discourse now about um the, the interpretation we can put on the iconography and the interpretation of the form and if both are linked and if we can consider that they are linked and if we should consider them as linked was that a question to all of the speakers Okay, so I can say a very quick yeah, thing, sure. which is that I, I did try to indicate in my paper that I do think that for Chadwick, the photocopier as the form or the technology is uh, the only means through which she could approach this imagery of the body, because for her it helped her overcome the trap of the specular. So because the photocopier enables a more, as she understood it, a more tactile image because it emerges from direct proximity to the flesh. And you can see that in, in the work that results, you can see the pressing and the wrinkles, the dimples in the flesh. And because she combined that with a, a method that in further enhanced that tactility through cutting up and collaging the images, those were the only ways that she was able to approach the imaging of the body. And um, for her, that mediation, that level of mechanical re remediation of the body was what enabled that imagery um, to work for her in the way she wanted it to work, which is to convey a phenomenological address to the body, not just a, a, an ocular address to the eye. So I think in the case of that work, the two things are very linked. Yeah, there is um, every, every technique has their own world of possibilities, okay? In the whole history of art, has happened the same. When the artist discovered that pigments could be mixed with a melt with oil, then a, a new world of transparencies of things happen. And then they start developing new languages. So you can imagine the, 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 the collapse of, of, of the revolution of being in front of a machine, something that is not seen as we used to see. Uh, because for example, the case of the specific grammar graphic grammar of a Xerox machine is, is so important because it's not photography, but it looks like photography. But when you see it, it looks like a drawing, but it's not a drawing. So for example, for, for the pioneers women artists, to have a machine, to have a technical system that use a specific graphic grammar that not going into the uh, naturalist thing, uh, uh, vision is important because when a woman female put nude in front of a machine and they take a picture, you know, they picture usually if you are using photography or video is going to pornography. So many of them go out from this idea of pornography using copy machine because copy machine produce a kind of a not not natural not naturalistic uh, representation and that was very important for them to develop famous speeches okay where no were confused you know or no were the desire of women of, of men you know of the world of men so so i noticed how exciting were these guys ellen chadwick for example oh this machine is very interesting because move on to a different conception you know the feelings are completely different if you are in front of a naturalistic photography this and, is the idea. And the space, I think, that we, we've all talked about. The, when you're imaging with the photocopier, you get this space that results that is quite uh, unlike photographic space and uh, difficult, you know, phantasmatic, so not very 
I was going to say not very real, but of course it's very real in, in one way, but it's not, uh, it's just not the perspectival space of easy access that you would associate with photography or with the history of perspectival painting. And it produces, it immediately insists on its own register of space and compresses the body within it in ways which begin to alter its meaning, you know, from the first moment. Um, I, I have a, oh, I had a question, um, but I was, it, it's, so, can it's, I just can yeah, I just go ahead. sorry to I was just wondering if um, Karen if you wanted to uh, respond to the the question which obviously was primarily I think about the visual but one could maybe we could come back to that a bit later in the context of materiality immateriality because I think there's something more to be to be said there sorry do please but this is this is in the same in the same vein um, but I'm I'm because I, I was I think that you're absolutely right about the tactility and and I thought I thought I was kind of convinced by her defense of herself in terms of that it's about a, a phenomenological experience of touch and, and the body and yet she didn't have to show the body in a way that figured as body. You know, if, if it was only about touch, it could have just been skin instead of a figure. And so I, I wonder, is there, even though the index and, and touch is clearly so much a part of it, is there some defense or consideration of figuration as, as figuration, and even though it's not working with a, a camera, <clears throat> you know, in perspectival space. Like you say, it is still some kind of space um, where we can make out figures. Um, and I, a, a, a second part, I, I wonder if any of you have, have more thoughts about the idea of the still life, because I thought that was, that was such an interesting point. Um, and the use of fish, like the skate, um, is is so reminiscent to me of still life, and yet we associate still life with oil paint. Um, I think primarily not. not so this. I think it, for me the key word wouldn't be figuration, but the right, why does she use the body? Because she does want to root her imaging in sexual pleasure. So she does want she doesn't want to eschew the nude and uh, the the idea of orgasm, right? So she absolutely wants to invoke those ideas which involve her own experience in, as an embodied woman and that are also of sexual pleasure as well as pain. And I think the association with uh, still life has to do with um, uh, death, you know, the, the ways in which the still life can connote, entropy. yeah, death and entropy and um, simultaneously, like the pleasures of the flesh and the, tempor the temporariness of the flesh. So that is the zone that she wants to be in. You know, she doesn't want to vacate that ground. She wants to inhabit that ground of embodiment of the flesh and uh, make it work dynamically and phenomenologically to expand um, our understanding of, of the world and our place in it. Yeah, but, but at the same time, we must think that a copy art starts or begins at the same time that pop art uh, culture. And it's important too, because this is one line, okay? The line of conception, cultural, etc. But in the other way, we have a lot of artists trying to be really a deep, honest pop artist. And to be a pop artist in that time, in the, in the 70s, is a little bit complicated because all the, manif the manifesto, the pop art manifesto, okay, uh, was completely perverse. You know, no, no, the manifesto said, no, we want a youth image, uh, free, uh, cheap, uh, et cetera, et cetera, not only, no only. And what happened with pop artists and pop art works? You know, they were only, you know, unique, uh, aura, uh, signed, uh, uh, expensive, etc. So some of the really pop artists, deep pop artists say, no, 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 this is not the way. So we are going to look for any other way of being really pop artists. And pop culture is just press a button of a copy and make a thousand copies and this is cheap, this is junk, this is sexual, this is uh, 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 multiple, 
etc. So uh, in, in the case of the still lives, it's also important to understand what should be a, sti a pop still life uh, artwork. And many artists were just doing that. I feel really a pop artist, not like Warhol, Rauschenberg, etc. I took, I took my, 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 uh, my uh, pockets, put on the glass of the copy machine, and just press a button. This is a still life. This is an instant machine. This is a very avant-garde uh, image, even more than what uh, finally our market is conceiving like pop uh, artwork. You know, this is my idea. It's interesting to think about that. I wonder, oh. I am uh, Jean-Claude Baudot. <coughs> uh, I start to collect uh, copy art in uh, the end of the 60s. And now I have about uh, 1,600 uh, 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 works, artworks, and about, from about uh, 500, uh, 500 artists. And uh, what is a better name for this? Copy art, it starts in, 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 in the United States. After that, Christian Regal write uh, the manifest of copy art. You know it because he, he participated to the creation I of the MAID. No, there is Xerox art, but it is a company. And this, no, for this symposium, it is Xerography. What is the best? <laughs> Well, we wrote so many lines about that, so many, many books about that. Yeah, Christian Regal was the first honorary director of the MIDE in Cuenca, okay? Uh, she disappeared. He disappeared. We don't know where Christian Regal is. He really disappeared 15 years ago. And nobody asked, tell me, where is Christian Regal? But Christian Regal introduced the idea of electrography, okay? And it came because copy art was not possible to be inside the art market world, okay? And, and Xerox was not convenient from 80s. Why? Because in the, in the 80s, uh, Xerox lose the patent, the hegemony of the patent. And then Japanese Canon, Minolta, etc., start producing uh, uh, copy machines. So say Xerox is just, you know, moving on to a, uh, commercial mm, complications, okay? So they decided not to st still uh, naming Xerox and Xerox art and Xerography. And that was a problem, okay? But at the same time, in the 80s, we start having new graphics. Graphics mean electric graphics, electronic graphics. So in that case, copy art just were moving from analogical copy machines to digital copy machines. So in that case, a digital copy was not exactly a serography, not exactly a serography, technically speaking. So that was the idea of moving on to a more general conception, which is electrographic art, which means a lot of things. But if you want to be very technician, very specific, you say, okay, this is serography. Serography means 60s and 70s, okay? Analogical works with copy machines in the 60s and 70s because we're analogical. If you are talking about copy art, you are talking about an art movement, an art movement, you know, that developed during the 70s, 80s, and 90s, and with three generations of artists. And if you want to have a general idea of this is inside a big book, is electrography, okay? That's why the, the, the Museum of Electrography in Cuenca has a collection of copy art, okay, of fax art, of uh, net art, of mail art, etc. So for me, this is clear, you know, in that sense. So uh, serography is the technical for the analogical world. Uh, then coming to digital is not possible to talk about that. And, and presently, uh, when, 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 when other not Xerox companies start producing and commercializing machines, we must to move on to uh, something more general. This is my opinion about, about it. I wish to see that. Chester Carson, mm -hmm. who advanced the photocopier mm -hmm. in 1938, named it electrophotography. See, si, that's right. So that was <coughs> the first, this new 
electrophotography process. Yeah. And electrophotography was the name patent by Marcel de Melonner, the Belgium uh, inventor, in 1932. So uh, five years before, an electrophotography process was developed already, you know? And he, he took, Chester Carson took that name, okay, to put it, because he named electrophotography because it was using lens. So at the same time, it's something which is dry, it is Xerox, dry, but the light is crossing lens. So in that case, it's also photo. Okay, that was the idea. But because light crossing lens is going to the to the to the roll, okay, and, and to the to the uh, um, I don't know the name, the, the plate, to the plate. Okay. So so this is this is interesting. Yeah, the, the name. We must know the history. But Klaus Urban wrote a three magnificent uh, books about it. And it's very clear, very clarified. And then if you take, uh, 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 we have the whole collection of uh, uh, technical review, technical journal in the 80s that Christian Regal used to write on that. And there are many articles, technical articles from Christian Regal developing these ideas and clarifying these ideas. At this juncture. Reproduire was the name of the, of the journal. Reproduire was in, pra in Paris, briefly. I'd, I'd like to exercise my um, power as chair just to, um, and also as someone who's particularly interested in textual art, to build on that last question because I've been thinking about the, the sort of taxonomy of the, the artist's book and I'm wondering whether we've got a similar issue of difficulty in terms of how we categorize these. I'm thinking of what Johanna Drucker says about the artist book vis-a-vis -vis the livre d'artiste, the former being by definition low-tech, um, sort of organic, usually distributed on a small scale, whereas the livre d'artiste, as she puts it, is a much more um, noble form and involves, um, you know, um, agents and third parties and so on. So Karen, I was curious to know, um, A, if you would subscribe to that view that, that the artist book in its purest form and particularly the, in, in these networks of distribution that you were talking about, you know, has it got to be low tech? Has it got, is that a part of its, its essence, so to speak? Um. I don't really subscribe to the idea that anything has to be anything. I think partly my interest in the materials that I'm researching is that they they kind of defy certain types of categorization. So I think to go back to some of the stuff that's already been raised, um, I, I think like the, the relationship between, for example, like Chadwick's work where we're talking about this very specific um, intervention with print technologies, um, there's still the production of a hybrid assemblage essentially so you know we could discuss this in the context of collage for example um i feel likewise with the materials that i was attempting to sort of highlight is that they utilize xerox within certain aspects of the the sort of um the journey of material between sort of preliminary um proofs to to actual copies themselves and so there might be an intervention of xerox technology at any point on that journey um, but those journeys are not, they're sort of punctuated by publishing in certain points. So we could talk about um, Chadwick publishing at the point that she, she places her cheek on the glass or that she places her hand on the copy button. So I think these, these kinds of um, moments are, are sort of um, points of discussion here as well if we're talking about space. So where is the space of publication in these moments? Um, is it... Is it the the bound object, or is it the is it the the preliminary um, sheets of paper? Is it the is it the um, is it the page with the with the tip X and and the visible collage, or, or the other way around? I think like these things are all up for discussion because, particularly with women's practices, you find that um, the first copy is not necessarily the vision for the work itself, and so. These things are all um, operating through economies of scale and economies of um, exchange, and that's something that low-cost um, 
reproductive technologies like Xerox enabled for a lot of our, um, for a lot of women artists was the first opportunity to actually circulate material in some sort of preliminary form. Does mm -hmm. that answer? Yeah. Very much so. Thank you. I don't know. We're, Sorry we're, to turn away. No, we're, <laughs> I think, I think we, we have five we minutes of... for, for uh, two additional questions. Is that okay? Yeah? Yeah, good. Um, so uh, I just wanted to go back to Chadwick's work uh, because uh, when um, I was listening to the, um, to the explanations, I've been thinking of Guy Tori Spivak's question, can the subaltern speak? And um, in this case, I was wondering about the status of the machine. And if we can say that the, the photocopier or the xerograph is a medium of resistance that voiced women and gave them the opportunity to speak for themselves and counter the male gaze, that was really, um, like, it was very, um, like, um, prominent in uh, male nude paintings, especially uh, the British ones. So... Uh, Yes, I, I think that was very much in the spirit with which just Chadwick, you know, worked that the machine would enable uh, an image, enabled her imaging of, of her body in ways that she felt could expand beyond the limitations of objectification represented by paintings like those that she invoked for Agonal Boucher. She wanted to work with that language, that imagery, and work from within it to change it, to transmute it to change, you know, that the whole impetus of the work is of mutability, to change and alter those representations into something deeper and more profound that speaks more to her own subjective experience, but that also expands the boundaries that she kept reiterating between self and non-self, between animals, vegetables, and her own body, and between life and death. That's the whole impetus of the work. She was very interested in French theory, uh, and um, her notes in the archive contain photocopies of interviews with Julia Kristeva and notes on lectures about Lacan and you know she says about of mutability in her notes that she wants it to use it to deconstruct the mirror stage so she's absolutely fed by reading that post-structuralism um, from which from which the idea of the subaltern speaking comes. One final question. Um, yes well uh, thanks to you all for your very interesting presentations and I have a little question also on uh, Helen Chadwick, um, and it's really uh, very close to this discussion of the mirror stage and the reference to Lacan, etc. Uh, I was quite impressed by um, the um, detailed references to art history, uh, Boucher, etc. And I was wondering whether um, you found any evidence of her relationship to surrealists of the 1920s, 1930s, um, is there anything about that in her archive uh, or not? Thank you. Not, not that I found. Sorry, no. <laughs> I have <Sorry. laughs> I haven't found you know reproductions of any works or mention of any artists. Uh, but there is, you know, the, I've only this research has just begun really, so um, there might be those references to be made. Um, yeah. Okay, I think at this juncture it is by my reckoning, exactly 12.30. So I think we can, okay. we can draw things to a close. Please join me in thanking our three speakers for a fantastic opening session. Uh, I just want to add a few comments for the speakers and people invited to the conference. You should have in your red folders tickets for your lunch. Please hold on to them because you'll need them in order to have food. And let's reconvene at 2 p.m., right? Okay, let's come back at 2 p.m. Thank you very much. <laughs>